January 13, 2015, Gulf County Board of County Commission Council session. Join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you again for a beautiful day you bestowed upon us. Lord, we ask that you lead us, guide us, and direct us. We go about, this board goes about conducting the business of the great people of Gulf County. Lord, as always, we ask that you look over our military, or look over our uh, law enforcement. It seems like uh, what's going wrong in this country. Lives on the line daily for us, and they have the same right to come home to their families. <coughs> we ask that you intervene in the end of this and see if we can't bring this to a close. Lord, again, bless this community, bless the fine people in this county, and in this great state of Florida. We ask this all in your precious name, amen. 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 extend a welcome to each of you for coming out to the January 13th regular meeting of the Gulf County Board of County Commissioners. Hope everyone had a uh, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and we're looking forward to getting 2015 underway. It will be gone before we know it. Uh, if anyone has any issues or any questions or that they would like to come before the board, there will be a time in the board meeting where I'll ask for public any, anyone in the public that has anything they want to come before the board with, and at that time, if you'll just be recognized, uh, you will be granted time to appear before the board. Uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and open up. Is there anyone in the audience has any questions concerning the consent agenda or the information packet? If you do be recognized. Anyone in the audience? Information packet or the, the consent agenda or the information packet. Where is the packet? Oh, uh, you can pull it up on the website. <laughs> huh? Uh, no. All right. Anyone in the audience? Anyone with the staff have any questions concerning the? An agenda or the information packet. All right, any of the board members? Any of the board members? All right. I need a motion to accept the consent agenda or the information packet. I move, Mr. Chairman. Got a motion by Commissioner McLemore. Second. 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 Second by Commissioner Quinn. Any further discussion? Any discussion from the audience? None. Motion passed. 5 and 0 to accept the consent agenda information mm -hmm. packet. Just pause a moment to get some more chairs out. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, a few chairs here if anyone in the audience. Sure. Hey, on. Okay, all right. We're going to probably have a pretty lengthy meeting today, so I'm going to change the format of just a touch. This time I'm going to drop down to item number eight, Sarah Hines with the uh, Gulf County Department of Health. Sarah, are you here? You are. There you go. How's Jack doing? He's good. Great. That's good to hear. Good to hear. I have other things. But you sure can stay.
All right, good morning. Good morning. All right, give your name and I'll write over here for you. Sure, I'll She's already had it, but give it to her anyway, just for the record. Okay, Sarah Hines, and I work at the Florida Department of Health in Gulf County. I'm the Health Education Program Manager there, and I just wanted to talk about an exciting opportunity that's come up. It's called the Fitness Challenge 2015. It was created by Casey Rhodes and Michelle Perrin last year um, as a small group of friends, but it later became a community-wide sensation. So what I provided to you today is our January Florida Department of Health and Gulf County newsletter, and on the front page is the event about the Fitness Challenge. But I just wanted to give you more information to read as well, so you get the entire newsletter. The fitness challenge this year is a 12-week weight loss fitness challenge. It started January 7th last week, and it lasts until April 1st. The cost is $15, and the winner of the entire program gets the whole pot. Right now, as it currently stands, we're at 80 participants. That's, not, that's $1,200, so we're looking good. But we're trying to get the word out, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it here. Um, results are based on the percentage of weight loss, so it's fair for everyone. And there will be weigh-ins every three weeks to keep everyone motivated. You can work out on your own, or you can coordinate within a group. And you can join at any time during the program period. Just know that the weigh-in, the final weigh-in, is the same for everyone, which is April 1st. Um, the weigh-in locations to sign up for the program are at either health department. We wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to sign up, so you can go to the WeWa Health Department location as well as the St. Joe location at any time. And the information below, um, you can call me at the Port St. Joe site, 227-1276, extension 205, or you can call Jesse Pippen and WeWa, 850-227-4193. And that was everything. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This time we're going into our first public uh, hearing on ordinance uh, leave no trace. Mr. Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, before you all, you have uh, three ordinances and three public hearings today, the first being the leave no trace ordinance. Um, in page 224 of the consent agenda is a copy of the public notice that was uh, advertised. Um, it has been published for January 5th and January 19th. Um, consistent with Florida Statute 125, subsection 66. Um, if I can, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I'll read it by title, and then I can provide you a brief summary or overview of the leave sure. no trace. Um, I know we have some staff that probably could offer some additional comment, and then if you would open it up to your public hearing. Uh, the, reading, the ordinance reads as follows. The ordinance of Gulf County, Florida, prohibiting and regulating obstructions and personal property abandoned on public beaches of Gulf County, Florida, and to be commonly referred to as Gulf County Leave No Trace Ordinance, requiring the posting of proper notice and signage at beach access points and in daily, weekly, and monthly rental units in Gulf County, Florida, for said policies to amend, be codified, and become part of the Gulf County Land Development Regulations, LDRs, providing for repealer, severability, and modifications that may arise from consideration at public hearing and providing for an effective date. Uh, commissioners, you have a copy of the ordinance in front of each of you. Um, I put it in orange at the top. It's the acronym LNT. Um, if you will, the first couple pages of your Leave No Trace ordinance, if you will, as you refer to it, are several whereas clauses. Um, and as we've gone over in the past under your ordinances, it's the public policy and the commission's will that supports your adoption of a local law. Um, there's been considerable discussion and debate um, starting in the Tourist Development Council and coming up through the council and in the community over the past two years with regards to a Leave No Trace uh, ordinance in some shape or fashion for Gulf County. Um, the ordinance in front of you all uh, details and is a result of that public discussion and the areas of concern from those workshops from the TDC and from the comments that you received at the podium over the last year and a half to two years. Um, it addresses from beach driving to chumming to not leaving abandoned property on the beaches. What is the defined periods of abandoning property um, to holes dug on the beaches, to camping, to uh, on fires on the beaches, um, so on and so forth. It also provides definitions um, and it further elaborates on definitions that have been defined in Gulf County in the past with regards to your beaches. Um, there's been discussions with regards to Sandy Shores. 
Uh, today is the first of two public hearings before you, Commissioners. Um, this is also going before the uh, Planning and Development Review Board on the 26th of January. That's been properly noticed as well before the Planning Department. Um, it'll come back to you all per statute for a 501 meeting on the 27th of January in the evening. and It's been noticed as such. So you'll have your regular meeting on the 27th of January at 9 o'clock. And then later that day, you'll have a special meeting that's been advertised and noticed specifically for these ordinance proposals that you'll hear in the evening to give the community an opportunity to come and hear them as well. Uh, I'll turn it over to, um, I don't know if Ms. Jenkins has any additional comments on Leave No Trace. I know we have a couple members from the CCA here, and I believe there's obviously additional public comment. But Ms. Jenkins, I don't know if you have additional comments. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Commissioners, in regard to Leave No Trace, um, the, uh, much of it has been crafted by reviewing Leave No Trace ordinances and other, that were adopted by other counties. We had a small committee that has met several times um, to talk about the issues and have it be all-inclusive. And also the data that we received from the beach um, maintenance program this summer and the beach ambassadors program all contributed to the draft ordinance that you have in front of you. And we, the whole idea was to find a balance, um, not just pick up as a, another county does, but craft the ordinance so it's true to us so that we can continue to be a, 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 you know, a destination for visitors, but also make sure that our local quality of life and our, and our environment are protected. Mr. Chairman, um, if I can, I'm just going to go through the various sections real quickly. If Ms. Jenkins, um, and then if you, I can touch on them, I can uh, highlight some of the areas. Um, as there is with any ordinance or any proposed legislation in Gulf County or any of the other 66 counties, there's um, always uh, comment and, and constructive criticism. So we certainly welcome that during the public hearing today. Um, just as I mentioned, this has kind of evolved from two years of meetings as your other ordinances have evolved over several years. So if I can, you'll, you'll see on page five is where the definitions begin in the proposed ordinance. And page six is where, where we begin to talk about what you need to remove. Right now, um, abandoned property on Gulf County beaches will be left and considered abandoned if not permitted and not tagged properly an hour after sunset. And they'll be permitted to go back out at sunrise the following day. Um, various communities throughout Florida uh, set defined times, um, say from 9 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning. What we're trying to do is accommodate the lifestyles and the various culture that we have on the beaches throughout Gulf County, both for the fishermen, for the recreational users, um, and down to all the visitors that we have come in, in addition to the residents. Um, there's several exceptions to leaving property. Uh, obviously, Gulf County officials are exempt, as is law enforcement and our first responders. Um, they all have an opportunity to be out there and utilize and leave property on the beaches if it's in their official capacity. Um, there's a permit section on page 8, which speaks to the county administrator having the ability to uh, receive applications from the community um, that provide some very basic information, such as the name of the contact, the description of the items, the location of the items, the duration of the time that will be on the beach, um, an acknowledgement by the owner in possession and control of the item that they're liable for the impacts for endangered species on those beaches. Um, one of the considerations and I guess the sensitivity of the ordinance is to be mindful of private property rights, uh, residents of Gulf County, and in addition to the visitors. Um, we've received uh, considerable comment from people that live along the beaches in the Gulf um, that are concerned about leaving their property out there as well. And I believe you'll hear from some of them. What we're trying to do through the permit and the administration office is to give the, the county the ability to issue permits to property owners, <coughs> special events, weddings. There's also commercial businesses, I believe, that rent uh, materials or beach equipment to uh, visitors and residents and the idea under section 5 is to provide them that ability. Section 6 speaks to digging holes on the beach that you cannot leave them overnight. Uh, camping on Gulf County beaches is defined not to be a certain distance from uh, waterfront residences. Uh, glass containers on the beaches are now strictly prohibited. Bonfires um, is to be a certain distance from any structure along Gulf County beaches. Um, chumming or fishing, shark fishing, uh, through blood baiting will be strictly uh, regulated. Um, and then there is also beach vehicles authorized, which is the Gulf, Gulf County officials and uh, law enforcement. Section 13 under page 9 is the soliciting and canvassing on the beaches of Gulf County. 
Section 14 is a noise ordinance or an enforcement of the noise ordinance and sound amplification. Section 15 is a breach of the peace. Section 16 is removal of sand, which is prohibited. And then Section 17 is with regards to our rental and vacation units throughout Gulf County that it should be, I believe, through the comments of the TDC, a partnership between the vacation rental companies and rental homes that they also participate in informing the public when they come to Gulf County of what the regulations are. So the administrative office will receive a proposed notice from the TDC that will go in each of these vacation homes um, so that it is um, noticed to each of the visitors, not only the residents, of a leave no trace ordinance. Um, and then finally, we've put in Section 18 the ability for the TDC each year to go out through digital and printed literature to uh, advocate and inform the public and visitors of what you know, the regulations and rules of Gulf County's leave no trace ordinance would imply. Um, commissioners, I turn it over to you for public comment and any comment from the commission. Thank you. All right. This time we're going to go to the people. Anyone in the audience for a public comment on this first reading of this Be No Trace audience? Is anyone in the audience? All right, Dr. Harden, we have one. Any any others that want to speak on this for the board on this? All right, if not, Dr. Hardman, come on, please. Good morning, Dr. Hardman, 123 Marina Lane, uh, President of Coastal Community Association. I'm so pleased that y'all are finally considering giving us some help and relief out here on, in, on the beaches. Uh, we've been working on this with TDC for two years, and we've been working on it for three or four years, trying to get some of these things addressed. And basically, it's a very comprehensive ordinance and a very good one. Um, we have spent a lot of time, and we certainly appreciate all this time that the TDC has spent researching, looking at what's going on in other counties, um, and we feel that we're, we're desperately in need of some relief out on the beaches. Um, we, we have a different type of clientele coming down now. That's one of our major problems. And where we used to have the family people that were coming here for the environment and protecting the environment and cleaning up after themselves, uh, because the other counties around us have ordinances that say you, there's some rules of play when you have out, go out on the beaches, we're now getting an influx of some of those folks that don't care about our beaches and don't care about our environment. And we're getting quite a volume. You, what we've got on any given day during the summer is the entire population of Gulf County would not match the number of people that are on the beach uh, in, in on, on the Cape. Uh, anywhere from 16 to 18,000 people a day. Uh, last summer, the, the state park had to close their gates a couple of times because they extended beyond their capacity. So the TDC is doing a fantastic job of bringing folks down here. We just need some rules for when they're here and at the same time try to protect the use of our beaches for our Gulf County residents. Um, volume is a major problem with things like the beach driving, which many of you have been out there and seen the dangers involved in that. At the same time, we don't want to curtail all beach driving, but we need people that know how to do it and what to do, and that's the big county residents. We've got to look at um, things like people we who live on the beaches um, have some rights, just like you would at your home, in terms of thinking about the right of way. Uh, if you have somebody come and throw a tent up on your, in front of your house in the right of way and start living out there and start relieving themselves on, the, on, on your right of way, you would get a little bit upset. And that's what we have to contend with. So as opposed to no camping, let's say don't camp where you go messing my front yard. <laughs> okay? So, you know, there's been some concern too about how you're going to enforce this. Um, bottom line is you don't not have a driving speed limit out here because you don't want to hire a deputy. But we could look at other options too. You know, we've got volunteer fire departments who basically take care of volunteer firemen, are, are some of our leading citizens. We've got turtle patrol people. We could have classes and have volunteers to help with enforcement of this. And so there's some options that we need to look at, but we need help. 
And each one of these issues that are being addressed here, and, and Jeremy has done a, a just awesome job of trying to maintain a balance. Uh, and, you know, each one of these are critical problems that we face every day living in South Gulf County. So we ask you to really consider passing this Leave No Trace. Give us some relief. Help us out. Let's protect our citizens. Let's let the guests have a good time. We're losing visitors. We're losing people because of the lack of safety and the problems on the, beach, on the beaches during the summer. They're going where there are rules. So let's, help, let's have some rules that are logical, reasonable, and we'll help everybody out. Thank you. Dr. Hardman. Uh, want to comment on this? This ordinance, I did, and I can't speak for the others, but I asked the attorney to try to draw up something the county could live with, the residents, the full-time residents could live with, and also our visitors, our guests that come down, could live with. And I think we've, we've got this pretty well nailed down. I don't want to step on anyone's feet, but still have to have some uh, rules and regulations, and that's what we were mainly going after. Dr. Hardman, uh, thank you for bringing up what you <coughs> Anyone else on Archer? Back here. If you would, I'll uh, give your name here to this. My name's Charles Burlingame. I live at 7099 West Highway 98. And I wanted to speak to the <coughs> the property lines. Uh, I live in uh, Yon Subdivision, which is uh, in addition to Beacon Hill. And according to my deed, I have a property line that runs 35 feet uh, across and 199.3 feet deep down to the mean, one, mean high tide line. And your ordinance takes in part of my property. That's one of my problems. The uh, Yon subdivision has its own covenants, and one of them is you can't build anything above ground uh, from 98 to the beach. And is there anything in this ordinance that says you're going to build walkovers in that area? Okay, there was talk of that. I didn't know if that was going to happen or not. But at any rate, that's my, my main problem is taking part of my property according to the rules here. Okay? Roger. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. If I can, I just, just, that's just this young man's coming on up. Go ahead. Just if, if they come up, if I can offer a comment to help you. Sure. Um, two things with regards to those comments. One was the structures, and there is a reference in the ordinance with regards to property owners that have boardwalks or private access to the beach. Right now, it's currently written that it's a request or the ordinance that the property owner drag their property back or their beach equipment back to the tow line of the dune adjacent to their boardwalks. So the reference in the ordinance right now is currently written with private property owners along the beaches is the boardwalks that are accessed from their homes that they take the property back to that. Um, Please to that point. Yes, sir. All right. <coughs> Victor Ramos, 2682 Indian Pass Road, Indian Pass. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear in the ordinance was, as far as bonfires go, is what you're allowed to burn. We've had a huge problem at Indian Pass with fishermen coming in at night burning pallets. And pallets are and full nails. of screws and nails. And we've got families running back there with children. And in the morning, I have many occasions I've had to go down there and clean this mess up. I'm getting tired of it, cleaning other people's, you know, fun times down there on the beach that we have to deal with and seeing these kids. I'm also a firefighter and a first responder. And I sure don't want to go down there having to do that too. So it, it's, it's exacerbating the situation at Indian Pass because it's getting to be known as no man's land down there. There's very little enforcement. And I'd sure appreciate in that uh, as far as bonfires go, maybe I don't know how you're going to specify what you're allowed to burn. It starts complicating the issue. Because people should be able to have fun, but when people come down there, take advantage of it to that point, 
<laughs> and abuse it is when we have problems. They're breaking uh, beer bottles down there, so I'm glad that the glass issue has come up. Uh, and that was my point. Thank you. That, that's a good point. <clears throat> It is, Mr. Chairman, and I, I, I'm, I'm in support of that, Dick. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I've that. seen those pallets, and, and if there's some way that we can incorporate that in by saying anything with metal objects you cannot burn, or I, I don't know, you're, and then you're clean it up. you can figure it out. And then clean it up before and that's you leave. In there. I mean, they, they leave those fires burning all night. And sometimes they bring some pine wood with rosin in it, and the acrid smell is all through that neighborhood. It's, it's just... You know, it's great for people to enjoy the beach, but there's got to be a, a responsibility to it also on their part. And that cleanup is in there, Victor. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Donnie, you have any comment on uh, that? Yes, sir. I, I'm making notes, obviously. This is the first public hearing. I'm going to come back, obviously, to you sure. all at your next okay. public hearings. As the next person comes up also, one of the things I did not mention in the summary, which is very important, I know Commissioner Yeager and We've had discussions with regards to beach driving. I spoke to county official vehicles. Section 11 speaks specifically to the amendments proposed to beach driving, and it is a considerable change from what you've gone through in the last two years. As you all recall, last year you changed your fee structure for Gulf County, for visitors to Gulf County, and then I believe late June, early July, you rescinded that and you took away weekly tags and left only visitors on an annual basis. The way Section 11 is now written is based on the response that you all had this past year is it will now only be county property owners and residents, permanent full-time residents of Gulf County. So weekly visitors will not be able to secure a beach driving tag. And that's the way Section 11 is currently written based on those comments. The other section, uh, Part 2, is that it goes from 15 miles an hour to 10 miles an hour. So those are two changes. I didn't mention them earlier, but they are considerable changes from what you currently have in Gulf County. It will be residents property owners only going forward. I mean, if I may, while she's one of the next ones coming forward. I think that's, that's where we've had most of the problem is, is visitors that come down that, that have, have no idea, just like I don't have a whole lot of idea how to drive on snow, they have no idea how to drive in sand. They go down on two-wheel two drives and get stuck and cause major ruts and those type things. So I think, uh, I think this is probably a, a good addition. <coughs> I do want to have some discussion. I hope some of the public has some discussion on many of them. Many of the folks here have children that have, that have lived here all their lives, and as they go off to college, they come back from college. I, I want to make sure we have something in there that, uh, that allow the folks that have been long-time residents to so be able to, to, to access the beach in, in that same traditional way. So uh, as we go through the public hearings, I'm sure there will be more discussion, but I, I, I do want to Figure that, that one out a little bit, Jeremy. All right, that all, Mr. Attorney? Yes, sir. All right, young lady, come on up, please. Good morning. Sharon Winchester, 193 Lightkeepers Drive, Beacon Hill, St. Joe Beach. Um, bonfires, yes, uh, the attorney spoke about them, and I was very disappointed that there was such a short sentence on them. Uh, we live at the near the public access to the beach. Pallets, like the other gentleman said, are a horrible concern. The nails are in the, right at the walkway. They're rusted nails. People are dropping pallets off for a later bonfire. They're dropping, dropping them off on the roadway or on the right-of-way. I don't know if your county people have noticed, but they're pulling the rungs out of the walkover and they're burning the rungs. I, I know they're burning the rungs because there's no rungs on the ground underneath in the sand. So that's a terrible concern to anybody who's walking over there with the nails particularly, and then they're destroying county property. And um, I'd, I'd like to see something more done on bonfires. A bonfire permit like Walton County has perhaps they have fire rings in other counties, um, but it is a very bad concern. When I first came here over a year ago, uh, I was very distraught to see all the nails. You can't walk barefoot with the nails. And I called the sheriff's department, and they referred me to the health department. And um, the lady said she would look into it, but they haven't stopped, and I've not seen anybody combing particularly for nails. So I just wanted to let everyone know that is a bad problem. So 
So that's what I had to say. Ms. Winchester, when I leave this meeting, I'm going out of the way. Okay. I'm going to go look. And uh, Mr. Mark, are you in here? <coughs> hey, Mark. We'll have some moment the county go out. And uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes, sure. Um, I, we have had this issue for years at St. Joe Beach. I know that it was an issue prior to being on this board as well. And even some of the private walkovers, there are some individuals that will pull the wood if it's loose enough to pull to burn. Um, but I also know that it, the bonfires are something that the residents truly enjoy at St. Joe Beach. So it, it is a balance. There is a problem with burning pallets. I myself have picked up numerous rusty nails on the beach when there's been a um, bonfire where the folks have burned pallets. I think some of that is educational. They're, they're just not thinking. They're burning pallets because they're easy to burn, and they're not thinking about the fact that the, that the um, nails are left in the beach. So it is a problem, and it is something that needs to be addressed. However, I do think that there are many, many residents at St. Joe Beach and at Beacon Hill that treasure being able to have a small bonfire at the beach. So it's, it's, I think it's something that's important. And in that language, I have had several calls um, with questions regarding the language. And would this be the right time to ask about that language, Mr. Chairman? Yes, if you'd okay. like to, sure. It says it's unlawful for any person to have open fires within 100 feet to any property or structure. So the question is, what does that mean to any property? They feel that the, the whole beach is property. Sure. Um, that section and camping have gone under considerable public discussion. And the question was, property is defined as the mean high water um, along the Gulf front. And it is really up for the commission. Um, it was a recommendation ultimately that it be adjacent to a structure. Um, so you look at the beach and you look at the distance from structures to a potential bonfire on those beaches. If you go 100, 200, in a lot of places you're pushing them into the water. So there was, it's really for the interpretation or the recommendation of the commission today and then at the end of the month. Um, where we led the discussion was ultimately to a structure. But right now it's or. Um, but we need some further direction from you as to um, it's more defined to put it in a structure 100 feet as it's currently written. And, and if you're a resident who lives on the beach and you want to have a fire behind your home but it's within 100 feet of your structure, are you violating the ordinance? I would say the majority of those property owners are prior to the native vegetation line and there are um, outdoor bonfires, what people have behind their structures and what they do there would not be, as I understand the ordinance, wouldn't be regulated versus visitors to the beach that are past the vegetation line that are opening bonfires. It's a difference under the Burt Harris Act and some of the other whereas clauses of people's private rights on their home versus the sandy shores of Gulf, Gulf, Gulf County. I think that this section will we'll probably need to look at it a little further and maybe add in some language about what can be used in a bonfire and be certain we're not regulating a, a person's right to have a bonfire behind their home. I, I'm not certain where the 100 feet, where the bonfires can be if we apply the 100 feet. But I, I do think that this is probably a section that we may need to expand on. Sure. Are you through, Commissioner? Okay, thank you. Uh, I kind of had that tag, too. Uh, I, I would prefer just to take property out of there to leave it as structures. And then there's no confusion uh, as far as elite property, as far as that. A and another thing I, I just wanted to mention at some point during the public hearing is this is the, f the first leave no trace ordinance that, that we've put into effect. There will obviously uh, be tweaks on this as, as we go and as we grow and as we, as, as we see changes needed. So I think the further discussion is, is it, once we get this in place, there may be some more tweaks that we need to do. But this public hearing is great to, to understand what the public wants and pub, what the public here that live here uh, uh, needs in, in this ordinance. So uh, in saying that, I just want to, to say that it can be tweaked even after we adopt it. But we appreciate the comments. Anyone else in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Come on. Come on. <coughs> Good 
Excuse me. Melina Elam, 7272 West Highway 98, St. Joe Beach. I'm really glad that a Leave No Trace ordinance has been drafted and that we are thinking along the lines of restoring our beach and keeping it looking like it should. And there's a couple things that I noticed in the ordinance that I don't feel are strong enough. On the issue of bonfires, I honestly feel that bonfires should be eliminated totally. And my main reason for that, aside from the fact that people do leave the litter on the beach and they do burn pallets that have nails that can become future dangers, my main issue with it is the smoke. I live right across from the beach, and when bonfires are occurring, I cannot sit out on my deck because the smoke is polluting our environment. Even in the backyard of my home, I have witnessed that and had to come in and not been able to sit out and enjoy being out in the evening on my deck because of the thick smoke, especially in times when there's very little wind. In the middle of summer, it gets very, very hot. Another concern that we might not be thinking about now because maybe there has not been a problem is that during times of drought, burning the fires close to vegetation could start a fire in the dunes. It could even reach the palm trees. So many of the palm trees along that strip of 98 there are overgrown and have dead growth on them. They're not maintained, which, of course, is another issue with the public works, I would assume. But I believe that that's a tragedy in the making or a disaster in the making if bonfires are permitted. I realize people love having them, and they've been allowed to have it in the past, but I think they should be left out. Another issue I have is with digging holes. I don't believe people should be digging holes in the beach anyhow. St. Joe Beach is very narrow, and there have been many times when I've walked the beach or walked my dogs on their leashes on the beach, and they have fallen into a hole because maybe it was dark and we could not see the hole. I know that we're saying that people need to fill the hole in, but why do people need – I don't understand why people need to burn on the beach or dig holes in the beach. Another issue I have, and I don't really have the problem on St. Joe Beach to deal with, is driving on the beach. I don't know why people are allowed to drive on the beach at all. It seems to me a totally destructive – it leaves ruts in the beach, it pollutes the air, and erosion is a big concern. I feel for all the people who live out on the Cape who have beautiful properties and they have to deal with a sea of cars all together having their caravans. And the final thing that I want to say and ask – Ma'am, hold just a moment. Your time has expired. She's about to wrap it up. Okay, I'm wrapping it up. All right, come on. Because I would like to know what strategies are in place to enforce this ordinance once it gets approved. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm going to leave no trace. Anyone else, if you would please – oh, sorry. Mr. Chairman, while he's coming to Steve, can he – Yeah, I see you, Mr. Penny. It's hot. Steve, cool her down. Steve or somebody that can get into that thing. You do it for me. It feels good to me. It feels good to you. Good morning. Give your name right away. Clay Lewis, 4452 Cape Sand Blast Road. Your name, sir? Clay Lewis. Clay. Good, Clay. Okay. I wasn't going to – I'm primarily not here in consideration to this ordinance, but I do have a couple of things that I might like to add. You know, we have – we're always talking about safety and property rights and things of that nature. And, you know, I do believe that beach driving should be permitted to the residents and owners. But you do have companies that rent, let's say, golf carts that have beach driving stickers on them to tourists and things like that. And so those people are able 
to drive on the beach as well. It could be a safety issue. I don't know. Um, uh, Cape Sandblast Road, uh, as far as I know, um, is a state road, and um, golf carts supposedly aren't to be allowed on state roads, um, as well as motorized vehicles on the golf cart. Those things are evident, uh, uh, you know, in large amounts, uh, which I believe uh, could be a safety issue. Um, you know, kids driving golf carts that don't even have a driver's license. So, you know, none of those things that are even right on the road are enforced. And, and the work for, for the county, in my view, is not in crafting the ordinance. It's enforcing the ordinance. Um, the leave no trace, we also have, this is my observation, uh, on Indian Pass Beach, uh, there are trash cans uh, that people can, can leave their cans, debris, uh, whatever, and I assume are picked up by the county. Uh, we have none of that on uh, Cape Sandblast except at the public, uh, except a few of the public beach accesses we have trash cans. A lot of the public beach accesses, there there are no trash cans. And so people, and even let's say the kayak canoe launch on the bay, uh, there are no trash cans for people to leave their debris. So they scatter it in the wetlands and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so enforcement, you know, is, is, is where it's at. You know, it's easy to craft and write and you pass an ordinance, but enforcement is another thing. Thank you. Can I, can Go ahead. I just share sure. one thing? I, I think we, I, I was under the understanding about every 500 feet, even on outside the, on the Cape Beach, I call it the outside beach. Oh, maybe you, here we go. On Indian Pass, there every mile, every mile, or if there's if there's a more populated area in between each mile, there is a can. On the Cape, there at all our public beach accesses. I do not believe we have one at Fordia with the where the um, kayak is, but all the the other ones. Uh, in fact, Salinas has multiple cans, so um, we could put more on the Cape if if necessary. That and I, I do think we probably need one at Troy Deal. Yep. A lot of folks see that. Right. Sure. Okay. Uh, have anyone else? While oh, she's coming up, uh, we have a fuse blown in our unit, and Mr. Mark and his staff working on it. And he said maybe <laughs> ten minutes can have it going. Great. Um, Gail Alsobrook, 162 Watermark Way, Port St. Joe. First, thank you for this ordinance. Um, the area in which I live is mostly rentals, and sometimes in the summer it's very difficult to be a resident. People are there for a short period of time, and they, they want to mac maximize and, and have a great time, and sometimes that interferes, that often interferes with peace and enjoyment of our property, so thank you. Just one thing to kind of connect two parts of this ordinance. One is about covering the holes that you dig, and the other is about bonfires and being able to, you know, dig a hole for a bonfire. I'm, I know of a, I know a person who walked up, was just walking on the sand. It wasn't here, but a bonfire had been covered over the night before, and that's, it's still hot. And she spent several weeks in the burn unit <laughs> because her feet were burned to, you know, really horribly burned. So just one thing to think about, if we allow the bonfires, if we allow them to dig holes and we allow them to have bonfires in the holes, um, they don't want to cover them up. You know, it's really hard to get them all cooled down and, and, and out before you put more sand on them. So that's just something to, to think about in dealing with those two aspects of the ordinance. Thank you. Anyone else? Leave no trace.
Excuse me. I cough. Um, Candace Warren, 130 White Sands Drive, Cape Town Bluff. Um, I have solutions here. I'm not. I'm so thrilled that you guys are even considering this ordinance. Um, I do believe that there is a, a economic and way of taking care of some of this by having um, a, somebody start a little business that has people are leaving at, instead of leaving their chairs and their broken down um, tents on the beach for us to pick up, that there will be a little business for someone, even if it's a high school group, that you leave your stuff there and sell it to the next person who's coming on the beach. You know, at least it's not trash. Um, I also, my husband and I, when we do bonfires, we have our own little pit that we bring out to the beach. We pull it after we had our fun, we pull it up to the dune line, go home, because it's usually by 1 in the morning or something, go back there by 9 in the morning and clean up our mess. And there's no mess in the sand. It's a disc that we put our um, logs in. Just things like that, if we could think ahead and make them available on the Cape or on St. Joe Beach to people, it, it would make half of this not an issue. That's, and again, one more time, thank That's you true. for even considering this. Mr. Attorney. Mr. Chairman, um, page five of the ordinance under section two definitions, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to just restate it for the public. The um, draft that was provided to the clerk's office and to the public for the last week and a half has been the definition of Gulf County beaches, which you had adopted, I think, about ten years ago for other ordinances. As you read through it on the third line down, it will reference the areas that are defined as beaches in Gulf County. And you'll see that there's a line called the Sandy Shores of St. Joseph Bay that's been included um, in discussion with the, with the uh, committee and the staff. We've included that, obviously, if there's a Sandy Shore within the interior of St. Joseph Bay, that will be included in this ordinance as well, whereas in the past that was not defined necessarily as Gulf County Beach. So I wanted to point that out to you in your draft that you have in front of you that wasn't available to the public last week, but that four words were added as well. Thank you. Jeremy, on that same, uh, in definitions, there's two references to 30B. I think it's probably meant to be 30B and 30E, so that's just a typo, but that, that will need to be corrected. All right. Do we have anyone else? We'll leave no trace. Anyone in the audience? Anyone in the audience? All right, public discussion. Leave no trace is now closed. It, 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 I, I've got a, a couple of further comments. Okay. Most of the things okay. that I, I was going to bring up or have, have been talked about. Um, one of the things uh, that's in this ordinance is shark fishing, and we certainly don't need shark fishing and, and, and coming around where we're, we've got tourists swimming and we're swimming and all those kinds of things. So I, I'm glad it's in there. One of, the, one of the options that we may have, and, and this is open for public comment, we may not even want to touch it, but uh, we've got a section from uh, the stump hole, the southern edge of the stump hole, around to uh, Eglin Air Force Base uh, beginning of property all around that point. There's, you know, a, a mile of beach there that nobody lives, and, and mostly it's fishing. Uh, very rarely do you see somebody swimming in that general area, so if uh, we may want to look at uh, the fishing aspect of, of this particular ordinance in that particular section where there's no homes, where there's no folks swimming, and, and, that, and it's traditionally used for, for fishing. Uh, the food for thought. Uh, we don't have to incorporate right now, but I just want people to, to hear. Um, I've mentioned uh, the need for ability for the children of folks that have lived here all their lives to, to figure out how we can extend that to those siblings that, that are off to college but come home for the summer and, and those type of things. Uh, one other thing, uh, a couple of times we mentioned in here from uh, the published sunset to the published uh, uh, time of sunrise, and that's uh, a little bit arbitrary. I think we could probably put from, from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. It would be a little bit more defined. I'll leave that to the attorney to, to for that particular comment. And I think that that's all that I had other than what we had already discussed, Mr. Chairman. 
Good deal. Okay, we'll back it up. Yes, anyone, any audience on uh, what Commissioner Yeager brought forth? Anyone want to make a comment on that? If you do, come on back up. Let me say this. Everyone that's came up has given some great, great input on this, and that's what it's all about. We need input, then we can fix this thing. All right, we already have your name. And okay. Go ahead, I appreciate the nine, the hours. But I do think nine is way too late, or two. Yeah, it, no, it should be later. I mean, earlier. We. I'm. Wait a minute. What, what do you I'm want? Sorry. Later I, or? I, <laughs> I, the, I. I walk the beach with, oh, with the turtle patrol, okay. and we have blows that happen at eight o'clock at seven thirty at night, and to have a car on the beach after seven is ridiculous. I, I was. I was more referring to the. The, uh, the stuff that's on the beach and the fishing and that type of thing. Well, we got on there to pull that stuff back by, by sunset, that type of thing. That I get, but a, a car or a, a golf yeah. cart does not belong on the beach in the summer. Any other time, they could go to midnight, but in, in during that period, um, we're going to lose a lot of babies. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Pardon? if I can, um, just as a final comment, uh, as this has been published and put out to the community, the public comment, obviously, that you received today, and as the attorney for the county, I received comment from your property owners inquiring, as well as your commercial business owners. And so I mentioned it earlier, and I just wanted to offer it to you five commissioners again for your consideration over the next two weeks. The language in the ordinance currently defines abandoned property at a certain time to pull back to the uh, toe of the dune. Um, the property owners that, in the comments that have received asked for your consideration is if they go to the administrator, in the way I've described it and, and the way it would be interpreted if you asked me, is if they go to the county administration office and fill out the one-page permit application as a property owner, identify who they are, the property that they own, and the equipment that is not abandoned and it's theirs, the county will have a way to mark or tag or put a sticker on it. So the property owners along the sandy shores and the beaches of Gulf County have an outlet to go to the administration to get a tag to indicate that it is their property, on their property, and it is permissible to leave it there. And that would go for those commercial businesses that rent out, if you will, uh, equipment to be there as well. The, the, the leave no trace is for abandoned personal property, not for claimed personal property, and that permit application process would be the outlet for those property owners to identify it. Okay. Comment from the board uh, on this uh, leave no trace. All right. January the 27th at 5.01 p.m., am I correct there? Yes, sir. We'll have the second meeting on the leave no trace. So, put that down in your calendar or memory bank, and let's see you back then. Okay. Trace the first. Next, public hearing ordinance, recreational vehicles. Mr. Chairman, the second public notice and public hearing today is the ordinance with regards to recreational vehicles. Uh, again, same public notice that went out to the public. Um, it was advertised for January 5th and January 19th, compliant with Florida Statute 125, subsection 66. It was seven in days in advance of today's first public hearing, and it is five days in advance of your second public hearing, the public notices. Um, I asked the planning department to go back and pull for us um, prior to today's meeting and public hearing, the planning board meetings that you have had um, in consideration of this. And then and you commissioners that recall from three years ago, you had several public hearings before you all on a prior RV uh, ordinance introduction and public hearings. Um, they pulled up seven different PDRB meetings where they have considered the language dating back to 2011, and the planning department provided those dates and those agendas um, to us for today. Um, the ordinance title reads as follows, and then I will um, summarize the restrictions and the definitions in there and then turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the ordinance title is, reads as follows, an ordinance of Gulf County, Florida for creating policies regulating recreational vehicles, uh, RVs, and their location placement RVs per parcel, use and storage of RVs within both unincorporated Gulf County and within the coastal corridor to be commonly referred to as the Gulf County RV Ordinance. For said policies to be amended, be codified, and become part of the Gulf County Land Development Regulations, the LDRs, 
and providing for the repeal or severability and modifications that may arise from consideration of public hearings and providing for an effective date. Uh, commissioners, you have a draft uh, proposed ordinance for RVs in front of each of you um, and it's been available through the, um, to the public as well. As I indicated, we've had uh, considerable PDRB comment and modifications over the last year and a half on this most recent draft um, and they have offered their comments and this is a reflection of those hearings um, in each amendment. Um, we have the planning department here as well. Um, as you go through the ordinance and for you that recall the uh, prior, the whereas clauses um, have been amended um, to reflect both the public safety concerns um, as well as the private property rights within Gulf County. Um, the first two pages are those whereas clauses and on page three of the actual ordinance it goes into beginning to define this ordinance um, and the proposed regulations in Gulf County. If you recall three years ago there was a tourist corridor if you will that there was uh, uh, there's a, there is a solid waste ordinance that you all have that defines a tourist corridor in Gulf County. The prior RV ordinance uh, mirrored that tourist corridor if you will um, in the RV regulations. Since that time um, from the public comments from the contractors, from the property owners, um, from the planning department, the building department, that tourist corridor has been modified and amended and evolved into a coastal construction corridor. Um, that coastal construction corridor is defined on page three under section four and what the county planning department and my office and the building department have done is created um, or introduced for your consideration three different coastal construction corridors. They are tied to the Florida uh, building codes um, as well as your FEMA maps and also historically your intracoastal canal um, as another uh, barrier within Gulf County. Um, there is a color map that's attached to the original Commissioners, you have the sure. colors provided to you. We have a larger um, a map for your, for your review and for the public. There's three different lines. Um, as I mentioned, there's an intercoastal, then there's a Florida building code, and I believe George is here to further elaborate if you all have questions, um, which is a mile off of the mean high water. And then there's a third line, which is a Class D uh, for windborne debris, which is a 1,500 foot from the mean high water line. And when that map is rolled out, the public will understand there will be three different lines. I think it's a yellow, an orange, and a uh, red. Um, the coastal construction corridor, those three different interpretations have been offered for your consideration through the PDRB and our various staff. Um, there's a definition of the recreational vehicle um, and then obviously parcels and your subdivisions and mobile homes. With regards to the regulations under Section 6, anyone outside of the defined area if you were to consider this proposed ordinance. There's those three different lines, a mile, 1,500 feet, or the intracoastal. If you were to define a coastal construction corridor as one of those three areas, anything landward of that line, it would not change the regulations in Gulf County. Your land development regulations currently, as they're written under Section 3.02, indicate that you're able to have one RV per parcel, um, that the lot coverage for the RV is not to exceed 30% of impervious coverage, that you need two parking spaces, that you meet all standard building setbacks, and that must comply with all the LDR and comp plans as they currently are written. So that simply reaffirms this ordinance, anything landward of that line that you'll see in a moment. Anything seaward of that line as you define it is then under Section B, under Section 6. And it reads as follows, and I'll read it. Um, for just for clarification for the public and for your commissions. Uh, it says RVs permitted within the defined coastal construction corridor shall be bound to all regulations stated above with the following additional restrictions. Non-permitted previously existing RV use and occupancy within the defined coastal corridor is strictly prohibited. Existing and permitted RVs within the coastal construction corridor may not set up or be occupied exclusively for temporary residential purposes, purposes by the owners of lots during hurricane season as defined by NOAA unless there is continuous and uninterrupted use and occupancy. Commercial uses of RVs along the coastal corridor are strictly prohibited without variance application, process and approval by the PDRB and a final approval by the county commission. Thereafter the occupancy must be continuous and RV not left unattended or unoccupied for 48 hours. 
Coastal construction corridor as defined above shall constitute portions of Gulf County mapped and designated in Gulf County and the lands falling within these areas that will be considered by you at the commissioners. Then there's exceptional circumstances. Under the sec exceptional circumstances, what we've done as this has evolved through your planning department and your planning board is to come up with the scenarios where residents and owners within Gulf County can come before the PDRB on an application and then ultimately come before you commissioners seeking a uh, variance to permit them to stay under a hardship exception. The first would be an RVs located on lots that are being stored and not occupied and are being located on a lot, same as an occupied principal dwelling. In essence, if you own a home in this coastal corridor, you are able to keep your RV on that property as you have a stick-built single-family dwelling and is simply being used for storage. The second is construction periods. The use and occupancy of an RV within the coastal construction corridor during construction or repair of a primary dwelling unit business shall be afforded consideration by the PDRB and approval of the commission for up to 100 consecutive days and renewable upon reapplication thereafter. Uh, inclement weather, hurricanes, folks can come down. They can actually build their homes in Gulf County as long as they apply for a uh, variance and approval of the county to have the RV on the property while they're constructing or rebuilding their home. Emergency periods under Section 3, which is the use and occupancy of RVs as a dwelling unit during disaster recovery, fire weather event, family medical emergencies, visiting Gulf County and residing in an RV while a family member is in care of an area hospital, shall be afforded consideration by the PDRB and approval of the commission up to 180 days. Hardship exceptions. The owner of both the same lot and parcel and RV within the defined corridor may, upon application, seek a hardship exception from specifically Section B1 of the Coastal Corridor and permit the continued ownership and maintenance and continuous residential occupancy of an established RV within the restricted RV zone under previous county guidelines. In essence, this is your grandfather clause. If you currently own an RV and occupy, use and occupy a recreational vehicle in Gulf County, seaward of this line and it is uninterrupted and you continue to do it and you properly permanent permit your RV on an annual basis you'll be continued to allow to do that and in essence that's your grandfathering clause anybody currently in Gulf County that's using and living in it will be able to continue to do that uh, the only two clauses with regards to the grandfather clause is when they sell the property that grandfathering ceases to exist and also um, if it transfers the property ownership to anybody else in name other than the current permit T and the owners of that property, it will cease to exist as well. The uh, final sections are with regards to enforcement and the effective date, what we've done through the planning department, your PDRB, and the, the comments at your public hearings before those advisory committees is to create a grace period, if you will, for people in Gulf County to understand and uh, comply with this and also for the county to implement a permit process and a one-page application. I think the comments and the discussion would be secured through the building department um, and that proposed date would be March 1st. As we move forward the idea was it was going to be a three or four month grace period. As this goes forward into January if you wish to move that date back uh, we do hopefully have that recommendation from you as well. Um, again this is the first public hearing and comment. The second will be at 5.01 p.m. on January 27th. Um, commissioners, any questions, I'll be happy to answer and hopefully we can get that map up and folks can all look at that if they haven't seen the lines already. I've been received a couple of the forms. They asked me to introduce folks okay. today. So I have a couple forms filled out under the county speaking, public speaking ordinance. Um, there is a Linda Sertich a Mr. Jay Rish and a Clay Lewis um, and if you would uh, sir before you take general public comment these forms were filled out in advance Mrs. Linda Sertich. All right, I wasn't aware of it but uh, before we bring these big people up hopefully hopefully the uh, Hopefully the attorney has shed some light onto some questions I know uh, and uh, uh, concerning this ordinance. And remember back everything. This is primarily for the 1,500 feet, or there's three steps to it. Uh, from the intercoastal north, there's no change in it other than one for partial. But hopefully he answered some of the questions here. 
All right, at this time, uh, gentlemen, we'll give, yield to the young ladies. Miss Linda, come up, please. There we go. Give your name out of here. Linda Sergage, 9025 Olive Avenue, which happens to be the wrong side of the street because I'm within the 1,500-foot range. Oh, you good. If I on the other side of the road, I'd... You're good. Okay, you have, a, you have the floor. Okay. We have a travel trailer. We live here. This, we permanently live here, and I realize we can get it under the grandfather clause. But it's what's written in here is the trailer that's on the lot. And I, does that mean I can never buy a new trailer? i young. I plan on living here for 30 years. That trailer's going to get old. That's a good question. That's a good question. And then, um, I can't think of it. Oh, then also, we bought this trailer. We're from Minnesota, so when we, like, hurricane, we're nervous about that. So we bought the trailer the way it is. So if a hurricane comes, we can pull the trailer so to Minnesota if we want to and bring it back, come back to live. But but if I leave for 48 hours, I lose my grandfather clause. That's the way I'm reading it. This is a really hard ordinance to read. But that's the way I'm reading it. If I take that trailer up the lot, that's it. We have in this public to bring these up where we can yes. address them, and uh, we need to know your feelings, yes, your and input. And it's an expensive so you trailer, question and I don't you. want to leave it here during okay. a hurricane. All right, Kenny, if you decide to update, uh, get a new one. Right. That needs can to be addressed. I, I don't think the way it's written, okay. I don't think, believe I can. So. All right. All right. Thank you. And uh, any sure you can. I, I, I do think on that issue, as we work through this ordinance, I do believe that we need to be cautious with um, penalizing for someone for moving an RV for a, an approaching storm. And if we incentivize people to roll the dice and hope that the storm doesn't hit because they will miss their grandfather clause, I think that could be a, prob a problem. So if, um, if there is some way we could carve that out, that if the RV is moved because there is an approaching hurricane, that that would not eliminate their, their grandfathering. That's a good question. Let's go here to the attorney. Um, Mr. Chairman, it is, um, I thank Ms. Sertich for the comments. Um, if you go back to your 2011 draft of the RV ordinance, there was a two-page evacuation provisions and regulations of if you lived within this corridor, what you would have to do. Um, through public comment, they wanted to make it a clear line. Um, I think in terms of the interpretation, Certainly, the, one of the public policies that's stated in the whereas clause is that the purpose of the ordinance, in essence, one of them is public safety, is to make sure that these mobile recreational vehicles are not here during the inclement weather. So certainly, if you move it for that reason when we're in the cone of whatever, that you have the ability to come back. Um, and I can obviously add some additional language between now and two weeks from now. The other comment about replacing it, um, the intent and the policy behind it, you'll see, is that there's a use and occupancy it's not specific to a actual, the specific RV. It's the use and occupancy of a recreational vehicle. And certainly if uh, folks who are grandfathered in want to upgrade or get new or replace or do what have you, they've already been grandfathered in. If there's additional language that would specify that they have the ability to do that, as long as they're still the owners and there's still a continuous occupancy of the permittee, they're able to upgrade and get something new and come on 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, so that provision, and I can further illustrate that in the language of the whereas clauses. Good. Okay. Thank you. Blake? Thank you. Clay Lewis, uh, 4452, Good. Cape Sandblast Road. I was uh, front and center of this ordinance last time around. The commissioners uh, that were there then um, probably remember, um, even though getting older we have limited memories. The issue, I mean, you're calling the coastal construction uh, area um, and the tourist corridor 
Um, the issues that I brought up back then um, were a lot about the exemptions, um, places that were exempt, um, uh, such as I, I, I don't see anywhere on here about uh, Indian Pass Road, for instance, um, which definitely falls into the criteria of the coastal corridor, whichever term you use, uh, 1,500 feet or, you know, south of the intercoastal or this, that, and the other. Um, you mentioned in this, you know, the blight and sprawl. If you exempt places, uh, then that blight and sprawl will happen in the places that are exempt. It just seems to reason that that's going to be the case. Exemption for a, a primary dwelling uh, throughout the year. I mean, it can be throughout the year whether a storm comes or not. Um, they're going to have the same impact. When the storm comes, they're not going to pick and choose to say, well, this, this, this RB is, is by a primary dwelling. We're not going to wipe it out. We're going we're to wipe the ones out that, that don't have a primary dwelling there. So I, I find that hard to, to, to fathom as far as, you know, what rights the people with a primary dwelling have as opposed to people that don't have a primary dwelling. Um, you know, the, the, the true definition of a hardship, I mean, do I not have to have shoes, be able to afford shoes to qualify for a hardship or, you know, are you going to check my bank records or tax returns or what? Uh, I, have, I, I don't see anything that really defines a hardship. And so I put that in, in your hands if you were to pass this as determining if I have a hardship or not. Um, it says that all RVs must meet setbacks in Section 6, uh, number 4. I'm wondering if those also uh, apply. I, I, I think we need to let him continue, but I, but I do think we, we're going to have an awful lot of people I that, are, I, I, that I, want to talk here. So a time. Couple, couple more statements. Thank you. I have, I have I, a I'm second. Commissioner Yeager? I'll have to have a second. Okay. I'll have to bring you. Do, do RVs that are exempted with a primary residence, do they have to meet the setbacks uh, of the neighboring property? Uh, do under Section 5, all RVs must comply. So, I mean, people come in and out of town and bring their RVs. You know, if they're homeowners down here, they'll bring them from wherever, go back and forth. But uh, there, there's a lot of things to consider. And just like I spoke about the, uh, the Leave No Trace, it's, it's not the work comes in enforcing, enforcing it equally with, it, with fairness for all. Thank you. If, uh, I think uh, to address some of Mr. Lewis's comments, I know George is here, and it would be very helpful for you to have comment from staff with regards specifically to the uh, seaward zones. And if George can come up and offer you some comments with regards to the policy or the intent behind what was introduced in terms of defining these zones, he can maybe elaborate a little bit further to help Clay and some of the other people in the public understand a primary dwelling and I can comment on this before you come up, George. The intent from the public hearings was if you live in a primary dwelling and you have a storm coming, you're going to take your RV and leave. If you're living in your RV as a primary dwelling and the storm is coming, you're going to hook it up and you're going to leave. Those are both permitted within Gulf County in this coastal construction corridor. The county has something on record knowing the owner, it's insured, and where it's being held in this zone. So these public safety and public policies that are put in the whereas clauses are to protect the public within this coastal corridor, both people with their homes and the people that are using them as permanent dwellings. And I think George can maybe elaborate a little bit further on the Florida Building Code and how the zones came to be. All right. Uh, Mr. Rich, do you want to yield to him or you want to come on up? I'll talk to Willie. Yeah, come on, come on, Jay. Then we'll uh, go to George. 
Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Jay Rich, Gulf County. Mr. Chairman, um, as we talk about these issues, they're very important issues. They're issues that we need some resolution on. <clears throat> but um, if you'll pardon the, the, uh, the expression, um, this is a sausage-making process right now. And I'm not so sure on this particular one we've gotten the hog out of the chute yet. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I'm here representing clients on both sides of the issue, kind of educating myself, trying to lend a few uh, suggestions based on some of my knowledge. And I think we've sold $650 million worth of property in Gulf County pretty much exclusively in the last 20 years. So we've had a few transactions. Um, it's, it's very important for people to understand this is a county that has a diverse socioeconomic strata. And we don't want to lose the sight of the many good people that come down here, bring a nice RV. Uh, some of them are $250,000, $300,000 RVs that they spend a lot of money in our businesses. Uh, they buy other properties because they like what's here. On the same token, when we get uh, some good old boys that come down here in the junker and want to take over the neighborhood, well, we got to do something about that too. And I don't envy uh, you all's job in deciphering that, enforcing that, uh, the sheriff's, his job, uh, I, I tell the audience, uh, the sheriff does not enforce, nor the board, the covenants and restrictions of a subdivision. If you live in a subdivision and somebody's breaking the covenants, you have remedies under civil law. I'm not a lawyer, but I think the attorneys in the room would, would echo that uh, phrase. Um, so a little bit of education to the public. I'd like to see us work on this and not get in a hurry, I guess, is my main focus here today. Uh, there may be some areas of exemption. Everybody's not going to agree. But if everybody agreed, we wouldn't have fun in life now, would we? Uh, but um, it looks to me like that I'm not up here to filibuster. I'm not up here to make demands, uh, give concessions, what have you. But I've got people on both sides of the issue, and I think we need a little bit more time to digest this, understand where we're going forward, just drop the gavel and and, and go forward with this. And I think the, the, the attorney staff and you all are doing the right thing and, and taking your time. And, and I would like to let's look at some common sense approach to enforcement, exemptions, those type of things, and, and see if we can't work through this issue, uh, you know, in a, in a nice, prolonged, protracted manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before I go to the Public, uh, George, would you come up now? All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, sir. Uh, George Knight, Gulf County Building Department. I, I can only explain to you about these wind lines up here as they relate to building. Primarily, that's what we are involved in in the building department, the building, not necessarily RVs. But the three distinct lines are different in that they're different wind categories. Okay. Mark, would you step over? And if you want to turn around, I think you can talk, sure. talk loud enough to pick up. So that, the first category is yeah, turn around face where they can see. The, the yellow line here, and for lack of a better word, that's the exposure D zone in building, and it's kind of like a high velocity impact area. In other words, when a home is designed to be built within that 1,500 feet, it has to be designed and built stronger than any of the other areas in the county. Okay. It's, it's an area where they're, they're expecting the highest impact from a storm, on a construction, on a building. That also relates to any structure that's built, not just single-family homes, but old barns, sheds, any accessory structure, especially to a principal dwelling, has to be constructed extremely strong in that 1,500 feet zone. The next line that you got here is the the orange, that is actually the one mile. That's what's considered the windborne debris region of the county. Now, it's still a hurricane prone region, but it's expected that the impact in that area will not be quite as strong as in that first 1,500 feet. But it is an area where windborne debris is expected to occur during a storm. In other words, things being blown around, thrown around, and otherwise creating havoc and pandemonium. Okay? So these two zones here, as designated by the Florida Building Code, are your, your high-velocity zones or zones of greater importance as far as wind loading. The Intracoastal Waterway is simply a line that the Board of County Commissioners back in 2009 or 10 uh, designated this as a demarcation line between our different wind zones of being 140 and 130. 
the cause, according to the charts in the Florida Building Code, our county is kind of crisscrossed. We came up with this line, and, and that's other than that being the difference between 140 and 130, that line really is irrelevant to building. Okay. Any other questions? On the line. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. All right, now we'll go for public comment. Anyone in the audience make any comments, questions on this RV ordinance? Please come up. I'm Paul Digby, 239 Highland View, Benega Street. Paul Digby, D-I-G-B-Y. Uh, uh, me and my family, for, we got three kids. We've camped at the state park uh, for over 30 years. As you know, it's harder to get in over there. So three years ago, all my kids were grown and gone. Me and my wife, we bought a place out at Highland View, 239 Benega Street. I went and got with George. And he said, told me what I had to do to get the permits, and we got some pole barn, and we got one RV on a 95 by 100 lot. It's going to fall with that exemption. But we don't necessarily keep it there all the time. If the kids want to come down to Panama City, we'll hook to it and haul it over there. It sounds to me like I'm going to have a problem with this exemption rule under the continued occupancy rule. The, uh, we stay there. We come down two to three times, two times a month. And uh, they, uh, and sometimes two or three weeks during the summer and sometime in the fall and winter. But I'd like to see something where I could move it off of the lot and then reset it back up, not just in a hurricane season. And then the, uh, the other option is that uh, if I know I can do the hardship exemption, the, um, so what I, and I think I could qualify for that. So. But if me and my wife, we're still young yet, I don't have any intentions of selling the lot, but once we die and I leave my property to my three kids, I'd like for that grandfather clause to apply to them in the way he just read it, it won't. The, uh, so I would like for my kids, just like you said, that has grown up coming down here camping in the, in the bay, and to continue to be doing that after I'm dead and gone. The, uh, thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Paul. We have someone over here. Right here. Sir, come on up. My name is Rob Haney. I live in Highland View. Rob, is that correct? Yes. All right, thank you, Rob. You have a flow. I just uh, bought some property in March and had my camper on it. I'm retired, and I moved down here from Michigan, and I have some property up in Michigan. And I would like to go back up to Michigan for the summer. In the fall for the nice weather and the good hunting and all that and then be able to come back here to my camper you know to live and live up there too because I'm sure a lot of retired people will be doing the same thing they come down here in the winter you know and then go back where they come from you know in the summer and uh, I just like to maybe be able to put something that in there too you know where you know, I, I'd be grandfathered in, but it sounds like if I leave for a certain amount of time, it's not going to be occupied. And i like to be able to come back to that because I'm not rich, you know, and that's, I live in a camper, you know, and I'm glad to be able to do that, you know, three blocks from the beach. And I take care of it, and a lot of other people around here that have been doing the same thing I'm doing, they take care of it. And... <clears throat> I don't know why they don't um, make people take care of their stuff around there, but there's some houses with all trashed out around them, and it looks terrible, and they don't mow the lawns. And I know certain other areas, they make people, you know, be responsible for <coughs> their areas. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tony. Uh, he, he does have a map. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioners, I, what I can offer to you um, is possibly some this Florida statute and Florida case law, and I think it will help the commission and the public obviously shape this discussion over this month. 
Okay. Florida Statute 222, subsection 05, addresses and constitutes dwellings for the purposes of a homestead. The Florida courts have taken the statutes, and you have motor homes and mobile homes. The courts and the statute have gone on to define what a mobile home is. And then the cases in Florida have to try to determine through the judges whether or not that homestead exemption actually applies to a recreational vehicle. The courts in Florida have upheld the statute and have not extended it to recreational vehicles, but what they have said is that if a RV is treated and is permanently, the word permanently parked and permanently lived in and permanently utilized as their primary home, that in Florida it can be applied for and utilized as a homestead exemption, which would extend the discussion as their primary dwelling. But one of the things in the case judgment is the permanent parking, that it doesn't get up and go, because other homestead exemptions in Gulf County and throughout Florida is you have a home, you can't take your home with you. And so the courts have looked at these mobile recreational vehicles is that if they are permanently parked, that they are to be considered for homestead exemption. And that's a whole other discussion, but the statute and the case law give you some guidance and the public as to what is considered permanent structures and what is not. And so when the language with regards to permanently using and occupying an RV in Gulf County as your primary dwelling, that's where it derives from. It comes from your statute and your case law. And it hopefully provides you some guidance as you go through this discussion over the next two weeks. Yes, sure. So, Mr. Novak, just to clarify, if someone has an RV on their lot, but they leave for six months to go live elsewhere, but they come back and live in that RV for six months and the RV remains, then that RV can remain. That is still grandfathered because the RV was not moved, even though they are not physically occupying for a portion of the year? The way the ordinance is currently written, during Noah's hurricane season, if you were within that zone, you could not leave it unoccupied for whatever you define that as. Right now it's currently 48 hours. It was 72. I think a year or two ago, Ms. Harmon, she was at the hearings. I think it was five or six days. So it's gone all over the board, but it's whatever is unoccupied and unattended during hurricane season in that zone. So you cannot leave it parked on a piece of property if it's not your primary dwelling. If there's exemptions, as you interpret through your hardship, that someone leaves to go visit family for two or three weeks, they're permitted, one. It's registered with the county, two. The county is aware of who owns it and where to contact them. It's insured. There's a lot of steps for public safety that have been taken to secure that RV, that property owner, and also the adjacent property owners. And so the ordinance as it's written right now would provide those functions or those safeguards to the county to be able to track that down if we had that 48 hours. And it's come down to 48, but it's been as many as six days, and it's gone down to 72, and right now it's written as 48. So whatever you all interpret that and recommend. Let me ask. Rob, let me just ask you a question. You say you – and we have a lot of people in Gulf County. I live in Weaver Hitchcock. We have people up there from Minnesota. They're fine people that come down to spend the harsh winter here, but they pull out and go back, and I think we have the same situation. I know we do. I know people right here that does that. I'm going to just ask you. You don't have to ask you. Are you registered to vote in Michigan or are you registered to vote in Florida? Florida. Florida. You're a Florida registered voter. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. As the public discussion continues, there's three elements that you all have considered over the last four years. It's what has Gulf County allowed historically. Currently, what are people utilizing it for? And what is the public policy behind going forward in terms of RVs in Gulf County? And so the ordinance before you, the goal, as it's written, is to address the people that have previously bought a piece of property and have an RV on it, the people that currently want to continue to use it, and it provides exemptions and hardships. So address it the second. And then the third is going forward, public notice in Gulf County is there are regulations for a coastal construction corridor for someone that wants to buy a piece of property and utilize it for something other than a single family dwelling within the corridor. So those three goals, if you will, through this ordinance are what it's striving to address, is your current RV, future RV, and then historically what you've allowed in the past. And the grandfathering and the exemptions have been crafted and modified over the last couple of years to try to address those concerns for people that previously bought here in the county for that intended use. And like I said, the public comment, we can hopefully modify it some more to address the current owners. 
One of the issues that I see is defining what this coastal corridor, whatever the area is that we choose to apply this ordinance once we reach some type of agreement here. And I know in the past this board was not able to reach any kind of a decision. I was not on this board, but I did observe the proceedings, and I know there was a lot of work done on it, and it seemed as though there was a one-size-fits-all approach. And we have modified that to some extent, but it's still kind of a one-size-fits-most. And I think we may need to consider some particular areas within, depending on, I'm still uncertain where this line is going to be drawn. But even within that area, there are very different types of neighborhoods and communities within, especially if you go up to the intercoastal. And this is something that it's a little unusual to me in this community. I've been here about nine and a half years, that there is no real true zoning here. And in most areas, at least in my experience, the zoning will allow you to have some variances, and I don't mean variance in the term that we've discussed here, but some variation, I guess I should say, within what the restrictions are and allowances are within a community. Because as we all know, a place like Highland View is a very different place than some of the areas on the Cape, and they may have different needs. So I think that we need to be very cautious with trying to blanket one ordinance over the whole area. If we had zoning areas, we could look at them, we could tweak the areas for what was best for those communities. I think this is a very difficult ordinance to work through. I think there are concerns on both sides of the issue, and I think that that is something that we need to consider. Being that we don't have any zoning, it's not something that's going to be easy to put into place, but I think that it is something we need to look at. And one of my concerns is if this line is at the intercoastal, how does this affect and impact White City and Overstreet? I've had quite a few calls about those areas. So I'm just putting that out there in the process that these are things that we need to look at. You know, you put it a lot more eloquently than I could have put it, but there are different areas. I have Oak Grove that's very different than Cape Sand Blast. Where we've had most of the problems has been in the St. Joe Beach and the Cape Sand Blast area. So I think from some further discussion on do we need to exempt certain parts of this ordinance for the Highland View area and the Oak Grove area or other areas that we, depending on where we actually choose this line at the end of the day. So I think going forward, that's something that all of us need to think about and to say do we need to exempt certain areas from part of this ordinance. I still think that probably one per lot, as the law has been in Gulf County for a long time, although we haven't actively enforced it, is probably appropriate. What we're talking about here will not affect what's already on the books for Weewaw Head Scooter or anything north of the, at least, the intercoastal waterway. So I think that needs further discussion because we are a very different community. And it may not be, I'm sorry, it may not be just you're in or you're out, but there may be some shades of gray here where some protections need to be provided for various areas, but some should be more stringent than others. And it's going to take some work, but I do think that this is an important enough issue that we need to put that work into it. And I'm more than willing to work with the attorney or whoever is working on this and hear from the community. But it's something the board tried to do and was not able to do in the past, and it continues to be an issue, so I think we do need to handle it. But I think that we need to look at the gray areas as well. Yes. I think you'll find on the lines that we, in the graph and the picture there, that defines the vulnerability areas to structures, what kind of impacts you have during a storm or during events. I would not want the public to misunderstand that if you're on the other side of that line that you are not vulnerable 
the wind degradation for Gulf County is very little. If you have a fast moving storm, uh, you may see only 10 miles loss between here and Wee Wahitchka, the coast. So if you're an RV even up there in the Dalkeith area, you're still just as vulnerable you know, to damage. It's, it's just, I just don't want the public to think that's that line, that there's no, there's no uh, risk. Uh, and don't get lulled. That if there's a storm coming in and you're anywhere in Gulf County, that RV actually needs to be moved out. And as George alluded to, that uh, when you have a mobile home within that 1,500 feet, uh, especially built, has special tie downs to try to withstand that wind loading. And whereas an RV is just strictly rely on a stabilizer. So that's the reason for the emphasis to move and, and get it out of harm's way. So just, uh, I was hoping that was clarification that, you know, it's, uh, um, those lines are mostly for primary structures, which you can equate to the potential damage to any other thing that's not properly built or tied down. That's all. On the RV ordinance, back to the public. I mean, the public wants to get anything. We have two over here, the young man, Sir, you come on. They'll get you too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Hi, my name is Greg Shurich. I'm at 9025 Olive Avenue. That was my lovely wife up here earlier. I just want to uh, uh, bring up one point regarding the grandfather clause. It's, I believe Paul was his name that spoke about his, his children and stuff like that. I mean, our kids have been down here on several occasions. Now, we moved down here going on five years from Minnesota, and we love it here, and we're residents here. But uh, our kids come down here. We'd like to be able to pass it on to them. I think we'll lose that with this grandfather clause from the way I – I believe it's written now. Um, would we be wise to put them on the title before this bill gets passed so that we know that they'll at least have first grabs at the property? And where does this, uh, where does this property go after, you know, if they decide not to do it? I mean, nobody's going to pick up the property then if, if they're not uh, going to be able to grandfather in, you know, other than putting up a structure or something like that. So there's concerns along those lines on uh, – you know, where does this property go after, you know, we move on, I guess is my, my question to you folks. Thanks, Greg. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank Good you for morning. being here today. Appreciate your time and energy. I'm Doug Smith, 9317 Olive Avenue. Uh, I'm going to come at this in a completely different way uh, because when I bought my lot, it was contracted as an RV lot. It was permitted as an RV lot, and now you're telling me I'm not going to be able to sell it as an RV lot, which is automatically going to cut the value of my lot in half. I'm in Beacon Hill. Uh, there's one house, <clears throat> excuse me, one house being built in the entire area, and that's within one block of 98. Uh, you go into St. Joe's Beach, it's a similar situation. There's been a couple of RVs come in the last year. No building. Uh, and you go through that, and then, you know, who's going to be coming here to fill these lots in? I mean, I don't know how long Beacon Hill's been around. I've been told since 1960. There are more lots vacant than there are RV lots. You know, it's, 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 it just had not built out. Um, so from that perspective, and, and, you know, and then I'm really <clears throat> offended by the uh, – the, the whereas, the uncontrolled placement and use of recreational vehicles throughout the county and the coastal corridor, this, you know, causes fall and blight upon the entire county, which affects the general health, natural beauty, public safety, smart growth, and welfare and the well-being of the residents. I don't understand how that plays in, you know, because it was permitted, it is restricted, you know, and I don't see RVs as a blight to the county. I, I, I consider it a source of income. People come down. I'm a full-time RVer. Now, I am not a resident of Florida. I was checking on it. Uh, when I bought this lot earlier this year, I was told that all this stuff was settled two years ago. Okay? That's the only reason I bought the lot, or I kept moving. I would not, not have to stay 
and set up my lot for an RV. So in that instance, I have not become a resident because of this condition. And I don't want to have to come before the planning commission every year or the commissioners and waste your time to be grandfathered in again and again and again. I think it's a complete waste of county time and energy. And I also look at these things from a perspective that rather than RVs just being a hazard, okay, what about the boats and trailers? What about the abandoned storage trailers, the utility trailers, not to mention the abandoned automobiles? You know, they were saying we're all coming from this from a fear factor. You know, most of the RV owners are going to be responsible. And Attorney Novak asked me last time in front of the planning commission what would I like to have eliminated. Well, the whole thing really, because I think you're coming at us and trying to dictate that we're two separate groups of people. You know, now we live different lifestyles. I'm a full-time RVer, have been nine years and three months. In fact, when the weather got cold, I drove four hours this morning to get back up here to talk to you all because I do believe this is important. I believe this still is America. You know, and this fear factor, I'm timed out, okay? Thank you for listening, and I'll be back again and get my three minutes. All right. Hey, let me ask you a question. I've been up here and doing a lot of note writing. Good. Go back and research it all. I hear you say just drop the ordinance. Yes, sir. I thought I heard that. Yes, sir. I wrote it down. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't know where you're protecting anybody from anything. You know? Now, I checked with George in the building department about building a pole barn that I could later enclose, and he gave me instructions on what had to be done differently. Now, I thought about that, but then, again, I'm looking at the value of the property. You know, if I'm going to build that house and there's no demand already, why am I going to put more money in that hole? All right. We got you that way. Well, hey, one more thing. Does anyone want to buy an RV lot? I've got one for sale. You know? I think we've got some realtors in here. You may want to. There you go. No, I've already got a list. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I've listed myself. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? We've got one, two, three. Why don't we just stand up and come on. There you go. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Thanks. I think it's very important that we have this ordinance, which is from the other side. But I think Commissioner Bryan has a great idea that it maybe should be put into different areas or somehow try to fit it for the areas that best need it. And I think the Cape and the Coastal or the what we call the Tourist Corridor is what needs it extremely strongly right now. And maybe a little clarification from Mr. Novak. With the way it's set up now or with the ordinance the way you have it written, can you buy a lot and come and go with your RV if you're not a resident? I'm not sure how that, how is it, if you're not a, you know, if you're not a resident of Florida, if you just buy a lot now, can you? Under the ordinance? Under the ordinance. If you were seaward of whatever line, not. Okay. If you were landward of the line, you would. Okay. All right. That answers that question. But what we have to consider and the county needs to consider, especially in the Coastal Corridor, is our dollars and cents, is because how much money is generated in our Coastal Corridor for the TDC, who we support hugely. And we bring about 69% of the tax dollars in from that area. And we have RV lots that people have bought next to $900,000 homes. And I talked with an appraiser last week. I met with an appraiser on a property out in Cape Sandblast. And he said this is affecting our valuations, which affects our tax dollars. And so that comes right down to the money we have to spend here. And on our beaches for our beach restoration and for our fire department and for everybody else. And so it's a, there is a valuation issue, I think, especially in the tourist community, in the tourist corridor as we have it out there now. And as well as the safety concerns with our, in the high wind areas, I completely agree with that. And I just think we need to look at everybody's needs, I know, but I think 
it maybe needs to be separated out a little bit. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I know Mr. Smith, I don't know if he left for good, but he, Mr. Smith did participate in a bunch of those public hearings. Um, I just wanted to touch on one thing, and he, he has actively participated and offered comment to the PDRB. Um, we changed the whereas clause on that uncontrolled or the sprawl and the blight, um, and we changed it a couple times after Doug came up and offered comment trying to get it to where it would not offend some senses. And, and what I wanted just to mention was it, it, it speaks to uncontrolled use an uncontrolled placement. It doesn't speak to RVs in Gulf County. It's just unregulated, uncontrolled, and, and, and the placement of them. So we change it up a couple times so that that light or that sprawl it speaks to is with regards to the use, placement, and it's, if it's unregulated. So we certainly don't mean by that clause to offend anyone that takes care of a recreational vehicle within this corridor. And, and I know Doug, he walked out, but he worked with us a couple times and offered suggestions, and we've worked it a couple times, and we can continue to do that. Good deal. Thank you. Okay. Come on. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Corbin. I currently live at 9106 Olive Avenue a hotbed of activity, um, but uh, I just wanted to share with you that, sure. you know, I'm building a house on Highway 98, and there's a house that just completed construction on Highway 98, and there's a house under construction up on Auger, and I think that's the one that he was referring to, but behind my new construction are multiple cottages that are being built, so our section of South Gulf County is alive with activity. It's not dead by any stretch of the imagination. But I was concerned. Um, I, I fully appreciate, you know, his pain where he feels that his RV lot is not worth what it was worth when he began to develop it. I have a stick home. Guess what? My stick home is not worth what it was before the camper compound of five campers went in right next door to me. You know, I had my choice. Do I want to look at the grill of an RV? Or do I want to spend $2,000 to put up a fence so it's not in my living room window? So, you know, having to blend, you know, these different lifestyles within the immediate community is a huge challenge. I am all for this ordinance because I think it does cap some of the uh, explosion of RVs that we've had in our immediate area. Um, I shared with the planning board that I did canvas my immediate um, area from Augur back to, back to Tulip and from um, the park back to Triton. And within that, of the developed lots, 20% either had an RV, an RV with a shed, or an RV with a pole barn. Now, you look at it from a taxpayer perspective, and for every house or RV that we bring into, into the community, there's, you know, people that we have to support, we use county dollars to support it. And when you look at the tax revenue that's coming from these, you know, you, your, your RV lots are at the very um, uh, low end of that spectrum. I think a pole barn currently goes for, you know, an $11,000 value where you've got your stick home people that are, are bearing the greatest burden for that tax. So I think capping where we are, you know, with RV development is just a, a thoughtful approach to how do we continue to meet budget. Everybody that's visiting Gulf County, living in Gulf County, is putting a demand on Gulf County resources. And obviously this year we had a huge budget shortfall that needed to be closed with a tax increase. We're just looking to say let's be thoughtful about how are we generating revenue Let's make sure that we got some, you know, decent, moderate, or high-end revenue to keep us afloat. So, thanks. Thank you. I am okay. All right, sir. Come on. Going, guys. Dave Gaines, 643 Dolphin Street. 
I've got a piece of property out in Highland View that I actually rent to RV people. Uh, some of it's contained, some of it's not. They, they have to be contained, some of it's not. I just got a letter 15 days I've got to make these people move. Uh, I don't think it's right. Uh, I pay the taxes on the property. I should be able to put on the property what I want. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I just don't see how you guys can say, hey, you can't have an RV here, you can't have an RV there. I've got nine lots. It's 360 foot long, 130 foot deep. And I'll be able to put nine pieces of property, no matter what it is, on that piece of property if I want. <clears throat> and that's just, I'm, I'm, I'm here just to tell you that I don't think it's right. David, are you a permitted uh, RV? No, but I'm, I want to do it, but if you guys, wasn't it $10,000 per piece for a septic tank or for sewer? That's a city. That's yeah. That's a city. Well, I actually was grandfathered in to have a sewer system put on that piece of property, and I paid the money up front, which was $500 at that time. And they sent my check back to me and said that that wasn't a developed dwelling, and it was it had a legal power pole and it had a septic tank on it. And the, the the house that was on it had just got moved whenever they done the sewer, but it was a legal legalized piece of property at the time to have a sewer tap put on it, and they would not do it. So I, I think this is this it's particular it's issue minutes, is yeah. an issue that quite a few people in Highland View have mm -hmm. experienced with city. But, but my pe the people that rent from me, I mean, it's, it's the only place they got to go. They keep the place clean. I don't have an issue. And, I, you know, I just don't think it's right for somebody to walk up and say, hey, you can't have more than one piece of. Would you, let me see that. Uh, dwelling on that, uh, on, a, on a piece of property, is 350 foot long and 130 foot deep. David, I've had a couple of constituents that have got one of these letters, too, and, and in talking with the building department, is George still in here and, and, yeah. and Michael? I think all, all the things are kind of frozen until <coughs> the board decides, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of ordinance we're going to have and what exemptions we're going to have and going forward. I tell these people that rent from me that is actually living there. Are there, is there, is it one on each lot? Is it one RV? Yeah, on that, I got three RVs sitting there, and I got there's divided lots right there. I got nine lots on that piece of property, and one of the RVs is my personal RV. It's just sitting on the end. It ain't being lived in. So you got one per lot. Mm -hmm. Nine lots. You've got, you occupied three of the lots. Mm -hmm. You have three RVs. Right. But when this meeting is over, if you can't get to George on that, and he might can. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. As for David, um, I don't know what the violation is. Um, under the LDRs, you're allowed to have one per parcel, and if it's in the county's jurisdiction, that's permissible. So I don't know what the notice from the code enforcement has, if it's something else, but I can certainly talk to David afterward and talk to George and, and try to help him. But you're allowed to have one per parcel as it's currently written for the last three years. That hasn't changed, and it doesn't change under this ordinance. All right. Uh, on back here, then we'll get one over here next. Come on, sir. My name is Cole Mayo, and I have property at 9132 Olive Avenue. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Thank you, sir. You have a full <coughs> so, um, I just want to take an issue that the previous lady spoke uh, earlier, and uh, to correct a few things that was said. Um, <clears throat> there's not five RVs on there. I own three lots. I take very much pride in my property. I probably have as much money in my RV in those three lots as that person has in their home. I keep it very well maintained. I do not put over the allotted uh, number of units. Um, the issue, I think, a lot of times is when people move into an area that are aware of what is in that area, then they want to change that situation, then they need to think about where they buy. Um, I hope that you all do look at this issue. Uh, uh, most of the time, you, I've seen several <coughs> issues saying safety, safety. Um, we all, RVers, normally would have enough common sense. If we have a problem, if there's a storm coming, then we're going to take them away. Uh, there is several places in that area that 
and it's not RVs mostly, that are dilapidated, that needs issues to be cleaned up. But uh, I do uh, and am along with a lot of the RVers. Um, we spend quite a bit of money every weekend that we come down here uh, enjoying the property and the uh, things that we are able to do. Uh, I do hope you all look at this very, <coughs> very long and hard. Um, I'm not sure on one of the issues it was showing that uh, if you own a home, you're able to have that RV and leave it in your yard all year long. So that would be a problem, I would say, if you allow them to keep theirs in their yard all year long and some of these other ones that, that would need to be moved. So that may be something I want to look at. Uh, but I appreciate your time. I just want to correct the issue, and uh, I do take pride in my property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully a new resident right here from Thomasville, Georgia. T. Yeah. Elliott is 9444 Alder Avenue. I spoke to a couple of y'all already. My biggest question is I bought my lot with the intention to use it for an RV because I've been coming down here all my life for a couple of years and then build a stick built house. We can't all afford to build a half a million dollar house at one time. Use and occupancy to Mr. Novak. A lot of us probably in this room come down for the weekends. Where how's that covered? We're not here four or five days out of the week, but we're here every weekend or every other weekend. <laughs> well, Good question. I understand it right now. If, if we adopted this ordinance, you, you would be able to do that. Uh, Correct. In that corridor. And we bought the property under understanding we would. And far as the homes uh, the lady was just speaking about, you know, I don't totally agree with that. When, I don't know when she bought that property or when she built that house. But did she not check the RV ordinances before she built that house? Why punish the RVers because the property owners didn't investigate before they bought? Correct? So the RVers are getting punished because of what's probably happening at the cave. They don't like the RVs there. The grandfather clause is thrown in there because Gulf County eventually wants to get rid of all RVs. Yet once the smoke clears. Correct? Not correct? I, I, I think that's valid. That I made some feelings on that. I, I think that's a valid concern that what's brought this to the forefront over the years is, is, uh, has been the fact that the, you've had multiple RVs put on lots, which was against the ordinance, and we didn't enforce the ordinance, but it, it's got to the point to where somebody does come in and and puts a lot of RVs on a on a, a, a lot. And it's got to, it, to the point that we've had to address uh, some of these issues. On Cape Sandblast, uh, it's, it's, we, we've had some that's worked out of commercial out of, out of these RVs, and, and we have to start this ordinance. We appreciate the public hearing. That's what we're here for, to hear all your public comments. At the end of the day, we do need to, uh, in my opinion, adopt something to at least regulate uh, the RVs as we regulate home construction, as we regulate mobile homes, and as re we regulate other things. So that's what we're here to So the answer to the question on the ordinance right now, when I put my RV on this lot and I go home for three days, four days, five days, I couldn't do that. I, I, I can take. I can take a. As you just explained, that is absolutely correct. Okay. So then the question for the commission and and for the RV owner is the enforcement versus the um, the language in the ordinance. And you talked about it during the leave no trace, which is does the county have the ability to enforce the ordinance as it is written? Um, the when I speak to the last four years, the, what you have in front of you is, uh, I, for lack of better words, is taking all the sensibilities and all the various property interests into consideration. 
What you have in front of you also provides a function for every existing property owner in Gulf County that currently owns a piece of property to come before this county and have an outlet or a safeguard, a release valve, if you will, to have a bear, an RV on that piece of property going forward. So the language exists after four years in this ordinance. The alternative would be to simply say there is a zone and from a day forward, there is no further conveyance of property to be used for RV ordinance. You can take out eight pages of your ordinance if you approach it from that. If you own property and you're in the corridor and you currently own, that would take out all the balancing of various property rights, if you will, RV versus single family dwelling. What you have in front of you is provides a function to deal with all your current property owners' interests and deal with them. You have a select group of property owners in Gulf County right now that have a RV interest. This gives you an ability to address each one of them. Yes, it will take time, and it will be a function of the county administratively and review in this commission, but you will address each one. You can provide those hardships. The alternative, like I said, is you can just put one sentence in, which is you create a corridor, and you can say from this day forward it not to be used on a future owner, but current owners could. And what you have in front of you is eight pages of creating an ability for this county to address each individual property owner's rights. So it's... And that's two different approaches to this issue. Sure. Yeah, let me ask you a question here. Go ahead. Somebody was bored. Uh, what I'm saying, I'm putting myself over in your shoes. You came down to Gulf County here, you purchased a lot. And I'm just thinking, you're going to put a septic tank on it. I don't think they have sewer out there yet. Right. Uh, you're going to put a septic tank. You're going to tap into the local water supply, probably pour you a slab. Possibly, I'm just saying this, and you want to bring, I don't know if you've got a big motor home, a fifth wheeler, I don't know. But you park it, you spend the week with us, and then you want to go back to Thomas for a week. You want to know, can I leave my vehicle, can I leave my RV there? Right. If I go back two weeks, can I leave it there? If a hurricane or if we get notice, I'll come get it. Is right. that that's primarily common, what that's that, common sense? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to and approach I've been this on another, in a I hate to know I had to. You don't want to invest in this. You say come back there if uh, it away. I go 48 hours and I can drive back one minute and then that's. Right. I'm, I'm two hours away from here. here. And there's probably a lot of us in that same situation. We spend our money in this county. We pay our taxes in this county just like the next man does. And, but the county is trying to say we're going to tell you when you can come and when you can leave. Basics. Okay, well, Ted, that's but I think that my last Wait. thought here is right. the one per lot. That's kind of, that makes sense. You already got it on the books. Just nobody ever enforced it. If you did the one per lot, and if you want to permit it so everybody knows who owns it, sure. That would probably solve 60% of these problems with those two comments. But not telling a property owner when they can come, when they can go. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you, Ted. The prior ordinance before you, Commissioners, addressed both of those, which was you could leave it in the tourist quarter, but you had an evacuation period, first and foremost, um, and it did not tell people when they could come and go. Um, and the county turned that down, went back before your planning board for eight meetings, and now you've come up with this variation. So the prior one provided that they could come and go. There was an evacuation period, there was a timeline, and there was an enforcement and permitting application through the county. So that was the prior approach from the county that was turned out. Yes, sure. Uh, so, Mr. Novak, uh, under that um, prior language, that would be that you were grandfathered in, but you could come and go, and you would just lose your grandfather when the lot transferred? There was no grandfathering in, okay. but there were evacuation and use language I, and I, I can't generalize it but okay. I certainly could go back and we That's can fine. Thank you. offer you that it's also public record so the folks can look at that just as well right. anyone else All right, I'm trying to I don't want to use anyone but when we get to repeating over and over Come on up. I'll see this young lady and uh, Dr. Hardman. I will. I like the young part. There you go, everybody. Uh, Jeanette pa Palmer. I'm a property owner in uh, Highland View, and right. I also own a house at uh, St. Joe Beach. 
Sorry, I'm having a little breathing problem here. But I would like to support what everyone who has spoken from Highland View has said. I own a couple modest houses in Highland View. One has been for sale. I've had realtors tell me, if you support these RVs, it will depress the value of your house and houses. And to me, it's the opposite. If you don't allow RV people to purchase in that particular area, you're going to ensure that it remains. Yes, you're going to ensure that it's going to remain a blighted area. In fact, I think I sold five of these lots to RV people. They're substantial people. They come with incomes and jobs. They keep their, my cousin who lives in Atlanta, he works for CNN. He has a little RV here. He doesn't get down much, but he pays someone to keep it mowed every month. It's just a teeny little modest thing. And where you look in the area at some of the absentee homeowners of these houses, they're in deplorable. They're blighted. It's not the RV people. I think our only hope for Highland View to increase land values and use, I mean, it has, there's such a negative attitude about Highland View being blighted. But there are people that want to move there who enjoy the fishing and the RV, what do you call the little vehicle staying and the boating. And they've been coming for years. And this is a way for them to get a stake, take a stake. Also, the size of the lots in Highland View are very varied. And in some, the only way you can use them would be probably for an RV. So for someone to come in and buy a lot in there, come up with $8,000 to $10,000 to put the sewer and water. And by the way, I had a similar problem with the water, which I talked to Ms. Bryan about with another lot of mine with the city. I mean, that's exorbitant. So, and then you're going to expect them to come in and where there's, in an area where it's mixed use. But to me, that's okay. It's kind of like, people like it because it's a little laid back. You can't have a fire, a campfire. You can have chickens, I guess, if you want to. But it's, you know, people in Highland View don't like, they don't want to be a part of the city because they like the freedom of it. And the people that are buying RVs, they're making an investment, $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 just to get started. Now, some of them may, like my cousin, when he retires, if he doesn't get laid off from CNN, because I guess they're downsizing, he would like to build a little cottage down here. So what's wrong with that? I think there's a little hint of like classism or something here in some of the tone of this, because I think this county can, it's a recreational county. People come here, why can't they bring RVs? It's not wrong. Now, cleaning up some of it, that's okay. But these are not, this is not the people that have spoken here or the people that are buying in there. So that's it. That's my opinion as a homeowner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Hardman, President of Coastal Community Association. A couple of things. From the standpoint of the safety issue, the wind blow issue, I don't think we need to go all the way back to the inland waterway. I think we need to talk about that mile back, which is the structural areas. The other thing is, this is a safety issue, and again, a balance was trying to be struck here to allow both grandfathering and for people who have already invested to be able to do, but also to stop, quite honestly, some more brought in. This county can't haul off RVs that are left down here when a storm comes in. And if we don't have some way to control that or know who that RV owner is, 
we've got some major problems, particularly in our beach coastal area, beach area, out on the Cape, out on the Indian Pass, what have you. Now, that, you can tell me you'll come get your RV, but I will tell you if I live in Tennessee or Atlanta, I'm not likely to head into a storm to pull my RV out. I'm just going to say that it's insured and the hell with the people that live next to me. Now, the people that you've heard, heard today, that's, that's, that would be an exception for them. They, would, they live in these things, they're moving them. So there needs to be some way that we can address both sides of this. I like the idea of the zoning area. Um, that makes a lot of sense to come in where there are areas. And, but again, you've got to say somewhere along the line, you've got to say you just can't leave this baby down here and head out without having some way to have some penalties or something or cost when the county has to go in and start trying to move or secure. The other is you, you're, you're acting like you're making an except you're, you're making an exception for the RV owner in this in this community that you're not making for any other type of residence or any other type of building. I cannot have a building built like your RV is in the coastal area. So you're making an exception for a vehicle to be used as a residence that doesn't pay taxes against the person who's having, I'm having to pay extra money, my clients have to pay extra money to build a certain way in this same area. So you've got to have some balance there. You can say you're hurting the RV person by not letting them have an RV. They're lying, but I will tell you, if you're living on that cape and somebody puts an RV next to you, your property values are diminished. Ask any appraisal. So what's your responsibility to the person that owns the property that's paying the taxes and building by the code and making everything back. This is an attempt to get a balance. If you add the zoning piece into that, I think you've got a good balance here. <coughs> and you're not getting a proliferation. And because we are a county without an RV ordinance, then we are getting the influx of the ones coming from down, uh, everywhere else into here. But there's got to have some rules. We come back. You can't have the influx. You can't have the volume increase without having some rules to play by. So please, just consider it, balance it. But we need an ordinance in place to have some rules in place for safety and for property values in certain areas. Thank you. Um, uh, Anyone else? I think we've pretty much covered this for a bee. Uh, for this well, at this time, we're going to take about a five, maybe a ten minute break. We've still got a lot of business before the board today, so we're going to. <laughs> okay, uh, we're ready to go. Let's see if we can move along here. <coughs> Mr. Butler, I, if we've got everything cleared up, no motions, oh, we had public on it. Now, let's go back over here to you. Get back and see. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I gave you a copy of an email I received from Commissioner Bryan. <clears throat> we're getting done talking about this one. I got another one I want to talk about. And you, have a, you say you have another one? I have another one that I haven't given you a copy of yet. But the reason I gave you a copy of it, <clears throat> same thing that happened several months ago. Commissioner Bryan has put something in the email that's incorrect, it's untrue. And it doesn't matter with me except when it's about me. And it does matter with me then. And, um, and she sent me an email most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time. And it doesn't matter when she sends emails to me, but most of the time it's Sunday nights, 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night. <clears throat> and Sunday night sent me an email, and one, I think it was about four different ones come in, three pertain directly to me. I made a copy of a couple of them, and what I want to do is put it in front of you. I had this conversation. We had a similar conversation before, and I told you that you know, I was prepared to go as deep as we need to go or as shallow as we need to go. At the point in time, the board was okay with Mr. Ryan and I sitting down there talking. Uh, a month and a half later, or longer than that, she did come to my office. We talked about everything but what we need to talk about. <clears throat> and... Now we're going down the road again, and I've got a, she has accused me of doing something here that's incorrect. 
And I, I need to get it clear. Now, one, when I told Commissioner Bryan in my office, I have no intention, never, ever, responding to her emails when they contain inaccurate assumptions, innuendos, comments about me, and I'm not going to ratify and justify <clears throat> and make her emails what they correct by asking a question at the end of the email. So the public doesn't like to hear this. I don't like to do this, but the only way I can handle this is put it in front of the board, and I want to say it publicly. I have no intention of ever answering anyone's email. Commissioner Bryan's only been doing it. When you send me an email with incorrect information and accusation and accusing me of things, I'm going to read this December 7, 2014 email. It's at the bottom of that page. Then I'll read the one that came to me Sunday night. Sunday, December 7, 8.34 p.m. Jeremy and Don, please send me a copy of a deed transferring title to Bickham Hill Veteran Memorial Park from the Bureau of Land Management to Gulf County. Have you done any research on whether we have a duty to inform BOM of the variance being considered by the BOCC which affects the park property? Question mark. And does the county have a duty to maintain the integrity of the park and boundary and protect the natural vegetation of the park's dunes, which would most certainly be damaged by the contemplated construction on the adjoining parcel? Question mark. If a structure is allowed to be built six inches from the property line, the contractor will have to be on county property while completing the construction from start to finish. What impact would this have on the park property and a potential liability to the county? Further, I have raised the issue of accretion in past meetings. Now, I mean, I can't remember everything. But the further, I have raised the issue of accretion in the past meetings. As you know, the park property accretes at the same rate as the adjoining properties. It does not appear that you have taken any steps to protect and preserve the property rights of Gulf County relative to Beacon Hill Park arising from the accretion of land on that parcel. In fact, under Jeremy's legal counsel and Don's advice, the BOCC accepted a conveyance of real property from Ellis Smith, which I believe contained either wholly or in part land which already rightfully belonged to the county through the process of accretion. Let me remind you, your duties are to the citizens of Gulf County as a whole. Your actions to date in all aspects of the Ellis Smith proposed variance matter do not reflect that position. Commissioners, I don't think I've ever said a word about Ellis Smith variance. I haven't had a part of it. I haven't even been here at some of the meetings when that subject were to come up. And the commissioner has a history of putting untrue things in emails. And, and it's, you can't change what's done. You can't change history. And, um, and this one, she's accusing me of doing something wrong. She's accusing me. I, I haven't advised you anything concerning Ellis Smith. But she's accusing me of advising you that you need to accept that piece of land and, and it already belongs to Gulf County. She insinuates it's already Gulf County's. This is one. And I don't know what kind of discussion we could have here to do with this. My main point is I don't want to let this delay. And a month later, I get another. Uh, she, she sent me an email and said, it's the third time I sent it to you, maybe the third time the charm. I told her in my office I would not be sending any more replies to any of her emails when she makes untrue accusations. I have no intention to do it, of doing that. So my main focus thing today is I'm telling the board that's what I'm doing, and then I'm not worried about it anymore. Now, what I want to do, Commissioner Bryan, each and every email you have, I want to answer each and every email you have, but I don't want to get slammed. I don't want to get accused. I don't want some untrue statements made about me in the emails like you did during the year last year and this one and the next one. And, and I don't like it. I can't help what you do. But what I am saying is don't expect a reply. You can send me another one saying this is the fourth time or the fifth time. I will not be replying to this type of email. 
I want to reply to every email that every county commissioner has, but you can't accuse me of doing something wrong. And then you make some other assumptions and throw in some innuendos in there that people are doing things wrong. So I've got one more email I'll give you. Chairman, on that, <clears throat> on the first email, I had asked David to load on that computer, I loaded a map of Biggin Hill Park, and in the properties around Biggin Hill Park, for clarity, I think there's a lot of people, including possibly a commissioner, that doesn't understand what is being done around Biggin Hill Park, and specifically, when you get down to the potential conveyance of that piece of property from someone to Gulf County. This is Big Hill Park. <clears throat> um, County acquired this uh, through a, a grant by the federal government. The uh, Department of Interior Bureau of Land Management gave it to Gulf County for recreational purposes. You see of uh, the 39.93 acres of what we developed. We, this is um, the uh, ball fields. The piece I'm, what Commissioner Bryan is referring to in, in her email, is this piece of land here. This 39.93 acres of land is for pretty much rectangle. We like some encroachments over here, don't understand all that, but it is what it is. But <clears throat> here, we have a definite legal description for that piece of land. And Commissioner Bryan's email is saying, through accretion, that she implies as if this piece of land is getting bigger. And if this piece of land is getting bigger, I would love for her to draw it out, what she thinks the shape of that piece of land is, if, if we were to accrete another half mile. But, but here is the point. Uh, this is 65 feet from Mean High Water, approximately 65 feet from this point of our property to Mean High Water. This private property owner here, his piece of land that goes to Mean High Water, and it follows this east to west section line. This piece of property here, his legal description goes to Mean High Water, and it butts, his legal description says it butts this line here, this east west property line. So as this beach in the next 50 years gets bigger, if it were to get bigger, then this, this gentleman's beachfront property has to get narrower, <coughs> and this gentleman's beach front property gets wider. So, so there's, there's comment in the email about um, the, the work we've done and, and determined about the accretion in, in, in protecting Gulf County. I don't, I don't really understand how this piece of property can grow at all. If, if we were to accrete another mile out, our piece of property is still 39.93 acres. But David, the next screen is my main one I want to show. <clears throat> And I think, Mr. Chairman, this is the next screen is most people haven't seen it. And you, you hear it, you hear it, you can't really visualize what's being done. Right, this is this is zoomed in. This is a piece of property that is um, south of Big Hill Park property. This is a parcel and it, that's the property line right there. 
and it goes back up, and, and that gentleman's got a house that's in the house. Right, that's right. Yeah, so that's two pieces. And, and these two pieces, the legal description goes to me high water. I was just not. The, uh, from just doing some rough, from, from this point, from that point to me high water, about 65 feet. From where you get off this boardwalk and walk, if you were to walk straight here, you're talking about 150 feet to me high water. And, and what, what I'm looking at is the next screen, David, showing the, the piece of land that Commissioner mentions in the email. Nothing to do with Don. Don never talked about the piece of land. Nothing to do with me itself. I got included in an email about this piece of land. He is, I, I guess that's the quarter acre. And my understanding, my recollection, two or three months ago, that's about 108 feet long of, of good front. Um, if that's 108, um, the distance, and, and I roughly looked at this as like 65, you were to go straight out to the gulf here from that point. And this lapse, if this is 65, this is probably 100 feet of parking line here. That, that if you were to come off the boardwalk, you come out on this and go to the beach. If this were continue to accrete, this piece of land continues to get wider on the beach because it follows it follows that east-west section line. So, Big Hill Park is made up east-west, north-south, and it's all four sides is that way. So, I'm not sure everyone has seen this piece of property that was, you know, whether it's donated to Gulf County or not donated to Gulf County. And two, um, if I go back to the email, it doesn't matter to me except the email. Go back to the email. This piece of property has nothing to do with uh, Bureau of Land Management it has nothing to do with that. If Gulf County were to acquire all of this land and all of this land, we don't have to ask the Bureau of Land Management permission to anything. This has nothing to do with it. And to, to, to make mention in an email that I may not be doing my job because I haven't made contact with BOM about the possible acquisition of this land. But, David, that's all I need. The chairman, that's all on that one. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to keep those up. I'd like to address the issue of accretion. What we're looking at here is, is a more current picture. This beach accretes. We're very fortunate that the beach at, at St. Joe Beach accretes. And years ago, there wasn't that much beach there because it's accreted. Under this state law, when land along a water body accretes to determine who owns the accreting land. You do not extend the landward lines of the property. And that, if you did, you'd end up with something like this, which is what we're seeing. Now, I don't know what the legal descriptions say on the adjoining land. Anyone can have a legal description drawn. It's, and all it does is describe a certain piece of property. It doesn't mean that they own that property. But when this land accretes, you do not just continue on the landward landlines to determine who owns the accreting land. So that park land would also accrete as its neighboring lands would accrete. And that is something that over the years, we're looking at a picture, current picture, but over the years that is something that is the responsibility of the county to maintain that accreting land for the people of this county. And that was the point of my email regarding accretion. Now the point of my email regarding if the BLM will allow someone on their land to construct a home is because if you're constructing a home within six inches of the property line, it goes without saying that the, the contractor would have to be on the Bureau of Land Management land, which is abutting the land where they're building. Now, it's clear to me by looking at the correspondence when they had to do the uh, access road for the landlocked parcel um, through the park that the Bureau of Land Management has great concern with any use of that park that is not related to recreation or history. And in fact, allowing a contractor to go on BLM land that has been given to the county but they can take it back is a problem. Also, that is park property, the dunes, 
all the natural vegetation there would be disturbed. So I believe that as a county commissioner in District 3, it is my responsibility to ask these questions. And these were questions that were asked. I can't seem to find any delicate way to be able to get information from the county administrator. And I will continue to ask the questions that need to be asked for not only the people in my district, but in this county. And I've done it by email. I've been asked by the administrator not to bring things up in public. Now I've been asked not to put things in writing. I spent three hours with the county administrator after this last go-around of an issue with my emails. And I would say almost the entire three hours were spent with me listening to Mr. Butler tell me that I'm a liar. Well, I am permitted to put my opinion into these emails. Yes, sir. I'm permitted to put my opinion into my emails, and I will continue to do that. And I have written, I believe, I've asked questions. I do the best I can to soften my questions to Mr. Butler. Now, I keep hearing that it's an issue for me to send emails at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. I'm working at 7 o'clock on Sunday night, and that's when I do send emails. Now, I did miss the special meeting on December 18th that this board held. I viewed the meeting, and everybody on this board was singing the praises of our attorney because he sends emails at all hours of the night. I appreciate that. I know what it's like to be an attorney and to work all hours of the night. But I don't understand why that's okay for some folks to send emails at odd hours, but not others. I've told you repeatedly that when I send an email, I don't expect you to respond if it's not during your work hours. If it is during your work hours, I only expect you to respond when your schedule permits. But I'm going to email when it's convenient for me. When you read your emails, you read them when they're convenient for you. And throw them in the trash, Mr. Butler, when you get them, because I'm tired of hearing all this. This is constantly. I understand. I understand. The board doesn't want to hear it. The public doesn't want to hear it. Commissioner, you had the floor. Okay. Okay. But I preface what I said. I preface what I said is I don't care when you send emails. If you'll go back and listen to the tape of today's meeting, I said that. I'm not chastising you for when. I don't care when you send emails. The main focus of what I'm trying to say today is you continue to accuse me of doing something wrong, you will never get a reply from me. And so what I don't want to do is wake up two or three months down the road and you come in and say, Butler won't reply to me. Well, I'm telling everybody today I'm not going to reply to you. Now, I will reply 100% of the time to you for decent emails when you're not accusing me of doing something wrong. You have accused me of wrecking. When did Don give you advice? I didn't say you gave me advice because you won't respond to me. I said you gave this board advice. Let me read it again. I understand. Maybe you didn't understand what I said. Now, let me read it again. If you can't understand it, I'll get someone else to read it to you. In fact, under, in fact, yeah, under Jeremy's legal counsel and Don's advice. This board. I will try to keep the conversation G-rated. But when you tell me, in fact, under Jeremy's legal counsel and Don's advice, I haven't advised you anything on this issue. You didn't say to me. I was talking about the action of this board. You said Don. You spelled D-O-N apostrophe S. As far as I know, that's me. So you addressed this to me. Mr. Butler, I said under Jeremy's and your advice to this board. I didn't advise this board. You regularly advise this board. You're the county administrator. These are issues that you deal with. It's your job to deal with these issues. You're doing what you do best. You're spinning the story. I have not advised you anything. You sent me an email and you accused me of recommending to you, this board, the acceptance of the conveyance of land, and I have never talked with any of you about this. I don't care one way or the other. I don't care. But what I do care about, and two, let me go back to something else you said. You said I spent a long period of time telling you you were a liar. I never used that word. Pardon? I have never used that word with you. 
you know, I can go get my notes. You are at least with the truth. I tell you, you are at least with the truth. I can get my notes. You spent almost three hours finding, I mean, ways that I can't even imagine. Many, many different and ways. I spend a lot Tell more me time that I that spin, that I that. lie. That you know what you said, Mr. Butler. You said that I cannot tell the truth. That it is, it is impossible for me to tell the truth, I agree. I and you that. that I, I don't even know how to tell the Commissioner, truth. Commissioner, I don't understand. And it. I sat and let you vent to me for three hours, and I tried to talk to you, and I asked you in that meeting for an example. I said, give me an example of what you're talking about, and you could not give me one example. Oh, that, now you spin the story, because I told you everything. The, the issues with, with, with the uh, I City Park, the issue with Bickham Hill Park, I gave you those examples. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk not about true. it. And, Commissioner, I don't think you can help it. I don't, don't know if I want to blame you or not, because I don't think you can help from, Why do you think I from, from spinning stories and telling okay. inaccurate information. Mr. Chairman, okay, next, next email. Let's, let's move on now. We're getting. All right. Come on. This one came in <clears throat> Sunday, 744. And again, I don't care when you send them, but that's when it came in. Don, I have sent a low email to you twice. And you have had almost a month and a half to respond. Email below, and I'll read, I'll read it. I've heard the third time the charm. Is there a reason you're not responding to me? Or, did, or if you did respond, I missed it with you, please resend your response. Email dated November 30th, Sunday at 7.31 p.m. Don, I read in the November 27, 2014 edition of the Star, which Warren Kopinski announced in the EDC November meeting that, that, would be, that this would be her last meeting as EDC director. Further, the Star reported that she announced that county officials, I'm guessing that means you, are searching for a new full-time EDC director and that this new director would likely be in place by the January meeting of the EDC. If this information is accurate, it is distressing to me that I had to learn about this major personnel change by reading it in a local paper. Have you apprised any of my fellow commissioners with any details concerning this matter? If so, when? Additionally, what steps have you taken or do you plan to take to fill the position by the January EDC meeting, or have you already made a decision on the replacement? Finally, what does this mean in terms of Ms. Kapinski's employment, if any, where the counties will go forward? If a star has misreported, please provide me with accurate information in addition to your response to the above question. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't have a problem with like that. I've told you several times. Now, at this point, I'm, I'm not saying I'm proud to say this. I have a bought nor read a star in probably five or six years now. And 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 so I'm not basically on your new email, I'm not going out and buy one to read it, see if what if you have misrepresented what they said or they misrepresented what Twan said and I'd have to go back to the minutes of that T D C meeting or the E D C meeting because I was not at the meeting when when Twan made a comment. The point. I was asking for clarification. I was telling you what my understanding was and I was I was prefacing it with saying maybe my information is incorrect. But if it so, is correct, could you please provide me with the correct information? The bottom line is, See, this is all because you, I have you to be very right, soft hold with up, you. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold it out my left hand. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, one thing. All right. Mr. Brian, <clears throat> I've got a book to go by. Can you guys get to write the book? And. And you, you decided, this board decided to get into the EDC business. Don didn't decide, this board decided to get into the EDC business. It's just another thing for me to do. So once you decide that, we, we have, from that point forward, a few days after then, we had to try to figure out what to do. We have had an interim director from that point to now. And hopefully soon we'll have a director. But you were acting like you that well, you said you were distressed to read in a local paper that we were doing this. This board voted on this. This board determined to do this. And you act like that's just something Don coming up with. I'm doing what this board said to and, and 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 that's the part. That's I really think you really need to think what you put in writing and what you say. If you quit talking and quit putting things in writing, you'll be okay because you get them all wrong. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Mr. Butler. If you can respond, then we. If Ms. Kopinski was strictly the interim director, which I had heard she was interim, and I heard she was not the interim, but if she was strictly the interim director, why would we use taxpayer dollars to send her for training if she was only the interim director while we were looking for a new director? But clearly, my email was asking for information. And you are the county administrator, so I ask you for information. This was a simple email that you could have clarified. I laid out to you that the information I received was from the local paper. So I prefaced it with saying maybe it's incorrect. But if it is incorrect, could you please provide me with the proper information? I don't know how to make it any nicer for you. You've made it clear from the start that you don't like me. That happened during the election, during the campaign. I'm going to finish my statement, too, Mr. Butler. I have tried to work with you, and you are the county administrator. I am the county commissioner, and we need to be able to work together. I agree. And I will continue to ask questions of you, and I expect a response. Now, there's nothing that says you can't respond to me and say, I believe what you're saying here is incorrect. But I'm asking you for information. I can't seem to please you. And it's okay. We don't have to be friends. But you do need to function as the county administrator for the county commissioner of District 3 as well. I mean, Chair, let me say something here. I speak for myself. This gentleman over here, I live 20-something miles from this room where I'm sitting. One to two to three times a week, I'm down here. I'm over in that office. I'm over in the courthouse. I'm walking around, and I talk. I communicate. If I have any questions, I can call. I call Mr. Butler and tell him I'm coming down. I'll be here. I'll walk in, and they'll say, the commissioner here is in there with Mr. Butler. Well, then I'll drift over and go over and talk with Dennis until he leaves because of a conflict. But I know the commissioners come out here and talk. Commissioner Bryan, I'm not singling you out for God's sake. But do you ever just come out and sit down and shoot bull with them? That's the old saying, you know. Just come in. Uh, Lynn, how you doing? You have a good weekend or anything? Do you, have a, do you come out once a week, once a month? Or do you tell me? I don't know because I can't, you and I can't be sitting there and talking. That's right. Um, at, when I was first elected to this board, I did. I came and I sat with Mr. Butler. I talked with uh, Ms. Lanier. I don't, I don't have an issue with Ms. Lanier, um, but I, ha I have come and talked with Mr. Butler. But it, it's difficult. I've sat with him for two to three hours, which he has chastised me for. I try to give him the time to speak about what he wants to speak about, and then on the back end of that, I'm chastised for it. L listen, this is a business, and... The county administrator and I do not have to be friends. I'm sure he has enough friends. I have plenty of friends. We don't have to be friends, but we have to be able to work together. And I'm perfectly happy keeping it a professional relationship that we work together. I'm not asking for any anything beyond that. But it, it has been clear that he does not want to work with me. And I'm, I'm not really welcome to sit. Now, last time I was there was three hours. And like I said, it was three, almost the entire three-hour period was of, of Mr. Butler telling me that I, I don't know how to speak the truth. Um, it was shocking to me, but I let him vent, and then I thought maybe we would get somewhere after the vent. It didn't get anywhere. Now, I, I say that the employees, there are employees for this county that they suffer repercussions for speaking to me. And I'm not going to get into that because the last thing I would ever want is for one of the county employees to have ramifications for speaking to me. But that is what's going on in this county. And that has gone on since day one when I was elected. And actually before I was elected, during my campaign, it was clear that there are a few individuals that do not want me on this board. 
why I am on this board. And I'm going to do the best that I can do under this, under these circumstances. But what's going on with our county administration and how the employees are treated when they try to do their jobs is wrong. Okay. Well, I'm gonna <coughs> The, the commissioner's recollection of our conversation is twisted. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, anything else, Mr. Buck? Sheriff, do you have anything? Mr. Quinn? All right, Commissioner, all right. Commissioner. Just one, uh, one quick right, right here. Um, I had spoken with uh, a tax representative, uh, the Department of, of uh, Agriculture, uh, about Indian Lagoon and the reshelling of Indian Lagoon. Uh, they're going to do what they can to see if they can't get us in something that's the same thing that, that uh, Franklin County is doing with the Bay. So uh, I've made that contact, and uh, hopefully we'll get to the point there. Just one other thing. Uh, I've also spoken with FDOT. I said I was going to look for a lot of different sources of revenue for the, for the uh, uh, nourishment project. Uh, in, in that section, it wouldn't be necessarily just for nourishment, it'd be for road protection. And the secretary told me that he could probably find some monies uh, to go with what monies that we can put together uh, for that particular project, but we don't call it nourishment, we call it road protection. So uh, if the board would allow, I'd like to write a, uh, get the staff to write a letter uh, to, to, to DOT requesting that they participate in funding for road protection at, at the stump hole area. If the board doesn't mind, I'll, I'll proceed with that uh, to, to help get some funding. And other than that, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Butler, will you take care of that? And the chair has nothing. Now we'll go to the public. Anyone in the public have anything? Anyone in the public? Very disturbing. My name is uh, Tommy Mays, 8609 West Highway 98, uh, Port St. Joe. I mean Mays. Mays, M-A-Y-E-S, yes, sir. All right. I've uh, been a property owner in Gulf uh, County since 1995, a resident here since 2003. Um, and I would just like to say very disturbed by uh, the exchange I just heard. I think there's a better way to go about this than to do it in front of the public. And I blame most of that on you, Mr. Butler, just from what I've heard. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It just, I don't think that kind of thing should be played out in this forum for what that's worth. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Fuck young lady. Christy McElroy, Port St. Joe, 1311 Woodward Avenue. I certainly don't want to add any gasoline to an already explosive situation. But I have seen, because I've been sitting here for four years, and in the last two years, um, certain employees pinpointed and people trying to put them in a box that isn't healthy and they have to defend themselves. I don't like seeing it. I think it's counterproductive. But then when I see a citizen come up and say something is wrong because an administrator is being kind of put into a box, I've also dealt with this administrator in a chair position, and I've always felt like I was respected and maybe not always agreed with, but allowed my say, and the same thing with staff. So I just don't understand why we're coming into another year in this crescendo of uh, unproductive conversation is still going forth. 
Everybody that knows me knows that I can be pretty high-spirited myself. But I'm able to work within a system and value people's expertise and, and try to build on everybody's perspective instead of just kind of, you know, drinking my own bath water. So that's all I'm going to say and appreciate right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Not. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you.